Νομίζω ότι πλέον είμαστε όλοι εδώ πέρα. Καλημέρα σας. Good morning. Καλημέρα, Αντρέι. Yeah. After many, many years again. Oh, no, no, not so many years. No. Well, This spring, or I don't remember. <laughs> as far as I am concerned, yeah. I have not seen you since Veronique's uh, going away from Athens. Yes, uh, she, she's there, she's there, just uh, so we, yeah. we meet. Hello, everybody. Hello. Veronique. <laughs> Kalimera. Kalimera. Kalimera, you have to be here, you have Είμαι η Διευθύντρια του Ινστιτούτου Μεσογειακών Σπουδών και είμαστε ευτυχείς που συνδιοργανώνουμε αυτό το συνέδριο. Mm. Ε, και θα ήθελα να ευχαριστήσω από αυτή τη θέση τον Κώστα και την Κατερίνα α, για αυτή την πολύ ωραία α, διοργάνωση. Hello everybody from me. I'm the director of the Institute of Mediterranean Studies and uh, I'm uh, very glad to be able that that uh, Costas and Katerina uh, uh, co-organized this uh, extremely interesting uh, uh, um, conference and uh, I'll be looking forward to listening to uh, many of your uh, uh, papers. So have a very nice and uh, good work. <laughs> Thank you, Jelina. Yes, Jelina. Ευχαριστούμε πολύ. Ευχαριστούμε. Κώστα και η Κωνσταντίνα Κατσάρη θέλει να γίνει panelist. Panelists δεν μπορούμε να κάνουμε παρά μόνο τους ομιλητές και τα προεδρία. Okay. Όλοι οι άλλοι αναγκαστικά είναι attendees. <coughs> Έχουμε γύρω στα 200 άτομα που έχουν δηλώσει ότι θέλουν να είναι attendees, αναγκαστικά. Έτσι. Απλώς μου έστειλε μήνυμα τώρα γι' αυτό. Το καταλαβαίνω, αλλά... <coughs> uh, I think it is here, so should we start, Κατερίνα? Ok, so, um, very of you to this international conference uh, in the honor of uh, John K. Davies. Uh, the topic of the conference is historical change in the ancient uh, Aegean. Uh, a brief word of thanks uh, before we start. Uh, we are very grateful to the, to the Department of History and Archaeology in the University of Crete and the Institute of Mediterranean Studies uh, for um, co-organizing this conference. In we are in particular grateful to the director of the Institute, Jelena Harlaftis, uh, for her support uh, with funding and administration, as well as the IT technicians uh, in the Institute, Aris Kidonakis and Eleni von Orta, who have made all of this possible. And finally, Irini Stagouraki, our graduate student, who was the coordinator um, for this uh, conference. Um, <clears throat> Now, I uh, give the, the button to uh, Kostas Burazelis and uh, Yanis Ksidopoulos, who will chair this uh, first session. Uh, just briefly to say, with uh, some papers, um, there will be handouts, which you can find uh, in the um, web page of the, the conference. I will post in chat uh, the web page of the conference for all of you. Um, to see. They are not there uh, at this right second, but minutes uh, you will see them uh, there. Not every paper has a handout, but speakers will say when there is a handout for their paper. So, Borazelis and Yanis Kizopoulos to start the proceedings of the conference. Well, uh, dear friends, uh, dear John, whom I cannot see, but I believe that uh, he's present. Yes, I am. Oh, yes, yeah, John. Yes, all, all is well. Here. Good morning. Well, I wanted Good morning. to say a few words just at the beginning. Uh, with a concise phrase, I would say that uh, the intellectually proper type family, the larger family, of John Davies convinced today on the web uh, to honor a person 
uh, whose work and uh, whole friendship uh, to other people and especially uh, to Greeks, I would say, has been variously attested. Uh, just shortly, I would like to uh, remind something, to remind you all of something that is not widely known, perhaps. Uh, John Davies was very instrumental uh, in uh, bringing uh, important uh, Erasmian students to Liverpool and in this way uh, forwarding the communication uh, between uh, Greece, especially the University of Athens and Liverpool at that time. Uh, it may be a special pleasure for him that some of the panelists of this colloquium are people who came to Liverpool because of him and thanks to him and I'm very glad that I have organized this in the past. Katerina Panagopoulou, Nikos Yanakopoulos, and many other uh, Greeks that have come and profited from their time uh, in Liverpool. I shall not uh, make uh, bad use of my rights as uh, president of this session. Uh, I am giving uh, right uh, afterwards, uh, the word to Kosta Vlasopoulos and Katerina Panagopoulou for their introduction of the whole colloquium. Good morning, John, and to all of you. Good morning, and thank you very much for those kind words. Katerina, okay. uh, Katerina, you open your microphone. Katerina will start with a short presentation of uh, contribution to ancient history, and I will continue with a few um, remarks about uh, the issue of historical change. Um, thank you so much all. Thank you, Professor Borazelis, for this introduction. I was keeping this uh, piece of information for my uh, final, for my presentation. Uh, uh, it is a very nice coincidence that uh, actually we're in the same panel with uh, Professor Borazelis and John Davies, because Professor Borazelis um, initiated uh, the first Erasmus exchange with uh, uh, UK universities back in uh, 1991. And um, I was uh, one of the first uh, who actually uh, activated that uh, exchange program. And uh, I was very lucky to meet this wonderful scholar who has been following me uh, all those years. Uh, so I'm very grateful for you both for ha having made this possible. Now, a few words on uh, actually the, our Professor uh, John Davies and about his work. Uh, dear Rector, dear Head of the, the Department of History and Archaeology, uh, dear uh, Director of the Institute of Mediterranean Studies, dear colleagues and friends. It is with greatest pleasure that we welcome you here today in the present Ancient History Celebratory Forum, which was set up in honor of Professor John Davies. We quite happily reconvene seven months after the prescribed conference dates, March 13 to 15, uh, 2020, though quite differently from what we had initially in envisaged for this celebration. But the radical changes over the past seven months have fully equipped us with greater experience and wisdom in order to unpack this conference's main theme, the structure and motos of historical change even more efficiently. Professor John Kenyon Davies, Emeritus Rathbone Professor at the University of Liverpool, was born in Cardiff in Wales in 1937 and studied classical studies Ancient History and Philosophy at the University of Oxford, where he completed his MA studies and submitted his doctoral dissertation in ancient history. Having taught at the universities of Oxford, um, St. Andrews, and Pennsylvania, he was nominated Rathbone Professor of Ancient History and Classical Archaeology at the University of Liverpool at the age of 40 and uh, stayed there from 1977 till 2003. 
He soon rose to this university's highest ranks as he served as head of the School of Archaeology, Classics and Oriental Studies uh, and as vice chancellor. After his retirement and nomination as emeritus, he repeatedly, emeritus professor, he repeatedly directed the MA seminar at the British School at Athens in 2004, 2006, and 2008, held visiting professorships at the Instituto di Studi Avanzati at the University of Bologna, and also earned an Onassis Foundation Fellowship at the Hellenic Research Center in Athens in 2010. In addition to being a skillful coordinator of prominent research projects, such as the lexicon of Greek personal names at the British Academy between 1972 and 1976, Professor Davies had been chair of Arche archaeological trusts, member of the Council and the Research Committee of the British Academy in the 1980s and 1990s, and auditor for the academic audit unit at the Committee of Vice Chancellors and Principals, and a member of the Academic Advisory Committee at the Liberhood Trust in London. He has also participated in assessments of foreign institutions, such as the Australian Research Council and that in Canada. Between 2005 and 2012, he acted as chair of the advisory committee at the Institute of Classical Studies at the University of London, and from 2006 to date, as expert advisor at the European Science Foundation. He has finally edited prominent journals, such as the Journal of Hellenic Studies uh, between 1973 and 1997 and the Archaeological Reports, alongside the series entitled Translated Texts for Historians uh, by the Liverpool University Press. The academic work uh, of John Kenyon Davies is particularly extensive and multifaceted. Mm -hmm. Being an author of three monographs, he has also co-edited seven collective volumes, most of which have been recognized as landmarks in their respective research areas. Equally important are his numerous articles, which have been published not just in the most important classics journals, but also in international collective volumes in several languages, English, American, German, Italian, and Greek. Many of these articles have constituted landmarks in the development of several research areas, having introduced new research paths and groundbreaking revisions of key issues. He works excels in that it covers a broad thematic and chronological range, tackling key issues of social and economic history, law and institutional history, political history and history of political thought, epigraphy and history of archives, cultural history and history of religion, history of ancient historiography in a time frame covering nearly the entire first millennium BC, has extended itself from the early Iron Age through to the Roman period. Equally impressive and rare is the fact that Davis has contributed to the study of ancient history both through the creation and employment of, of general theoretical models, as well as through completion of most important studies requiring an eye for detail. It is also worth noting that even though he retired in 2003, a particularly important sector of his curriculum has been published since, highlighting thus his energetic, never-ending academic input. This brings us to the first portfolio of Davis' work, i.e. the history of archaic and classical Athens. His first monograph entitled Athenian Property Families, 600 to uh, 300 BC, uh, published in 1971, is a cornerstone for, for the study of the economy and society of classical Athens, enabling the elaboration of data collected from a broad spectrum of studies ranging from postography and demography through to the economy and society of the polis. This primarily epigraphic corpus comprises the individuals of ancient Athens who are known epigraphically or through literary sources to have undertaken expensive tasks to the benefit of the city, i.e. triarchs or undertakers of liturgies. Reconstructing wealthy Athenian families of the archaic and classical era, this work aimed at assessing the impact and limitations of wealth in Athenian public life and beyond. 
Equally important is his second monograph, Wealth and the Power of Wealth in Classical Athens, published in 1981. Building upon the foundation of his first meticulous prosopography, Davies attempts a broader synthesis of the distribution of wealth among Athenian citizens and investigates into its social and political implication. This work has highlighted an impressive inconsistency between the Athenian political system, which was based upon a compensatory model in taking decisions in the distributing magistracies and the Athenian society and economy, whereby only a few thousands of Athenians possessed outstanding plots of land. This study opened up new scope in the assessment of the breadth and potential of the Athenian elite, enabling demographic, financial, and other approaches. Equally critical in his contribution to the study of the Athenian democracy is um, his, first, uh, his, uh, his next work. While most researchers consider Athenian democracy an incarnation of democratic beliefs and the result of conscious action, Davis prompts us to comprehend the emergence and development of democracy as the inconsistent outcome of an effort to handle a series of practical issues such as localism, corruption, diplomacy, making the most of human resources, etc. This model of a democracy without theory had and still has worldwide implication, i.e. as to how one of the most critical issues in ancient history ought to be studied. Particularly significant are also his articles reviewing the nature and the genre of developments in tackling the above period of history. Despite his major contribution to the study of ancient Athens, the work of Davis tactfully avoids Athenocentrism. Numerous works of his focus on the history of non-Athenian communities, i.e. Ephesus, Delphi and Phocis, Epirus and the Molossian Kingdom, Macedonia, Sparta and the Peloponnese, um, actually uh, go beyond Athens. Particular reference ought also to be made to a number of key studies in the history of ancient Crete, especially on the economy and on their legislation based on the Gortin law. This broad geographic and temporal range of Davis' work brings us to his second portfolio. Building upon his earlier studies, Davis has offered to us a series of important synthesis on the development of Greek history. That his general history of the classical period um, between 500 and 300 BC, published in the Distinguished Fontana series under the title Democracy and Classical uh, Greece, which you see here, has been translated into six languages, including Greek, and so eloquently his international stigma. While most narratives of ancient Greeks are limited to the history of wars and politics, Davis offers an impeccable synthesis of narrative and structural history, binding together politics, the economy, society, and civilization, and fostering new periodizations and landmarks in ancient history. Equally important is his co-edited volume on the Hellenistic period in the most distinguished collective history of antiquity, the Cambridge Ancient History. The thrust of Davies' research falls into the economic history of antiquity. In addition to his two important monographs regarding the Athenian elite and the role of wealth in classical Athens from the 1990s onwards, Davies expanded his scope towards two further directions. The former involves the expansion of the temporal horizon of his studies in the, to the Hellenistic period. His three co-edited volumes on Hellenistic economies in 2001, 2005, and 2011 constitute landmarks in the study of Hellenistic economy, and their plurality is now officially recognized. Davis will offer groundbreaking specialized studies exploring themes such as the economic role of Hellenistic palaces in 2005, the complex economic profile of Ephesus, a prominent Hellenistic city, and the significance of the trade of aromatics in a different volume. Equally critical, however, not just for Hellenistic economies, but also for the entire history of antiquity, is a triptychon of extensive articles which reconsider the historiography of the study of ancient economies, project theoretical and methodological problems, and present a series of refined models illustrating impeccably the function and reproduction of ancient economies. 
uh, ancient economies, models and models in 1998, Hellenistic economies in the post Finlay era in 2001, linear and non-linear non flow models for ancient economies in 2005. His important synthetic works on the economies of the classical uh, in 2007 and Hellenistic era point to the same direction. A distinctive feature of Davies approach is his quest for missing links tying economic history with other important aspects of reality, i.e. the history of religion, military and institutional history. He has studied issues such as the economic history of religion, the association among ancient temples, the lending system and numismatic circulation in an article in 2001, the significance of the transfer of financial knowledge upon the construction of, of Hellenistic monarchies in 2004, or the effect of the economy upon the historical work of, of Polybius in 2013. There is no doubt, however, that what constitutes his most important contribution in this field is a series of groundbreaking articles focusing on the conjunction between economic developments, such as the expansion of trade and the emergence of minting, with the development of state structures and forms of wars. The study of the interaction between the economy, state expansionism, and the new type of naval war, based on trirings, for instance, enables Davies to endorse a radical reconsideration of the history of Athenian hegemony, which has fully reformed his study. It is at this point worth mentioning the most important work of Davies in relation to the history of Greek institutions. In fact, many related studies of, his, of this constitute points of reference. A first thread of his research interests explores a the various facets with the which the citizen identity acquired in ancient Greece and the diverse principle upon which it was constructed. A second key thread focuses on state formation in the archaic period. While most such studies focus on the polystates, Davis forms an interpretative model co-examining the latter peripheral koina and monarchy such as Macedonia and presents a nexus of financial, social and political factors which reshaped diverse forms of state formation. These articles reshape entirely our comprehension of archaic history, which Davies examined in a number of methodological and historiographical contributions. Other studies of his address themes such as the notion of sovereignty vis-a-vis -vis ancient polystates and monarchies and the institutional subdivisions of cities. Be beyond his important theoretical propositions, Davis has a most significant contribution also to the study of ancient sources and to the methodological frame of their interpretation. His contribution to the study of inscriptions and to their employment by historians is doubly undoubtedly multifaceted. In fact, a volume which he has co-edited on the association of epigraphy with historical discipline constitutes a point of reference in regard to that. Equally important is his work discussing the form and development of archives in antiquity uh, in 1994 and 2000. A distinctive feature of Davies' approach is his effort to combine several aspects of reality. Particular reference is due to his projection of the complex nature of archival sources, i.e. public inscriptions, which combine cataloging information with monumentality, functionality, and identity issues. Davies' studies on archives and uh, archival documents in Athenaeus, in Athenaeus and in the 4th century BC historiography unfold yet another area of his research pertinent to the relationship between archival and literary sources and to methodological problems in the interpretation of the latter. Going beyond his studies on the use of comedy and oral tradition by historians, he studies on ancient historiography, such as the work of Polybius in 2013, Ephors in 2014, and Theophobus in 2016 are particularly significant. Moving beyond the above mentioned main threads of Davies' research, the breadth of his enactment in a series of other sectors is quite impressive. In addition to his contribution to the history of law with a number of important articles on the Gordon Code, we may focus on his contribution to the history of religion. 
His key interest rests on the Panhellenic religious center at Delphi and on the cult of Apollo Pythius, which he has promoted through a vast series of articles. As we have already reported, his special contribution to the history of religion rests on the study and promotion of the connections among diverse aspects of, of historical reality. The association between religion and economy, the connection among religion, sports, literature, and identities, as well as the employment of the social network analysis for the study of the history of religion. Clearly, Davis has contributed critically to our approach and interpretation of three diverse periods of Greek history, archaic, classical, and Hellenistic, spanning through 800 years. To his research gravitatem may be added his insatiable eagerness for teaching several years after his retirement from the University of Liverpool in various forms. For instance, in addition to directing the MA seminar of the BSA, he has repeatedly participated in the school's activities in specific areas, such as a tour from Isthmia to Sparta, and more recently a tour of Crete. In addition to the doctoral dissertation, which he has co-supervised or co-examined as one of the last prominent experts in the history of classical Athens, several of his students are active researchers and or maintain from important positions in international academic institutions. John Davies has, a, has had a long-standing presence at the Department of History and Archaeology at the University of Crete. He participated in the international conference entitled Networks in the Greek World, which the department co-organized in 2006 and has given since here two more lectures in 2010 and in 2015. It was especially in the critical period between 2012 and 2015, when there was only one member of staff in the field of ancient history in Nefino, that John's self-funded visit at the island and delivery of a lecture back in 2015 evidently constituted an act of support to our ancient history program at the most critical curve. Reassessing thus his critical contribution, not just to research on the Athenian democracy, but also to opening up new paths in ancient history, his academic polytropia and multifaceted teaching skills, his broad administrative experience and consistent support to our university, the Department of History and Archaeology and the Senate at the University of Crete decided in 2019 to nominate him honorary doctor, being convinced that his presence is bound, to, is bound to enrich our activities and set a high example for us to follow. It is worth noting at this point that this is not the only honor toward John. An elegant volume An elegant volume co-edited by Zosia Archibald and by Ian K. Wood entitled The Power of Individual and Community in Ancient Athens and Beyond is the outcome of a conference held not long after his retirement. Dear John, the attendees in this virtual room would like to congratulate you on this new achievement of yours. And the members of the University of Crete welcome you cordially to our community. We all treasure the high standing paradigm you have been offering to us. <laughs> I would like to thank at uh, this stage uh, to invite my colleague, Kostas Vlasopoulos, to open up the agenda regarding the topics which we will be discussing over the next three days. Thank you. Thank you, Katerina. Um, I will try to be brief so that we don't. Um, go very late. Um, this conference, of course, is in honor of uh, John's contribution, but at the same time, the topic we've chosen uh, is one in which John has made very significant uh, contributions. So I will say a few words about um, the kind of topics and themes and questions uh, we want to explore in the course of this uh, conference. And hopefully, these sort of questions and issues uh, will be part of our uh, discussion in the course of the conference. So, um, change, forms of change, historical change in the ancient Aegean. Um, we can start with uh, forms of change. And there are, of course, a variety of forms. We can think of forms of change according to the fields in which they apply. So, 
economic change, social change, political, cultural, religious. Um, we have devoted a whole day to the different forms uh, of change according to fields. And one of the major question is what um, aspects apply to particular forms of change in particular fields? of change is a form of change internal to a particular field or a society is it external or is it entangled internal and external at the same time a third um, distinction concerns intention is it a planned form of change a willed form of change is it unplanned is it fortuitous or, and this is quite important, is it unintended? Quite a lot of change is in fact unintended change. Nobody had that uh, change in mind. Another distinction concerns outcome. So distinguishing between different forms of change according to their outcome. Do they have structural outcomes, structural changes in particular fields or societies? Do they have conjunctural outcomes that apply only to specific periods uh, uh, or conjunctures? Or are they failed changes, changes that didn't succeed? And finally, according to perception, are we talking about manifest change, which is obvious to the people who live through those changes? Are we talking about latent changes, which only uh, happen gradually and are not uh, perceptible uh, to those uh, to, during whose lifetime they happen. A second uh, major uh, issue is periodization. The traditional periodization of Greek history distinguishes between the archaic, the classical, the Hellenistic, and we have devoted a whole panel to this traditional periodization. Is this periodization still useful? Is one of the questions we want to ask. Does it work for all forms of historical change or does it work better for some forms of particular uh, of uh, historical change rather than others? Third question, did all forms of change move in the same direction during a particular period? Some forms of change moved in one direction and other forms of change moved in other directions. And finally, are there all uh, and construct new periods? A third topic concerns narratives. Uh, there are plenty of narratives we use in ancient history, but unfortunately we have devoted insufficient time to think about those narratives, their form, uh, how they came uh, to be, and their the narrative about the uh, gradual Uh, of slave societies or the, the crisis of the late classical and Hellenistic polis. Some of these narratives are still influential and still affect how we study Greek history. Others have been criticized significantly over the last uh, few years. We want to identify such narratives and examine them um, in uh, their current um, shape in ancient history. Fourth aspect concerns models of change. There are a variety of ways in which um, we construct models to account for historical change. There are biological models, birth, rise and fall of a particular society and so on. There are cyclical uh, processes, like, for example, the processes of intensification and abatement that Horden and Parcell have, have emphasized in their work on Mediterranean history. Uh, there are conjunctures, specific points in time in which important changes happen, and of course, crisis, um, a typical case of a conjuncture. There are long-term processes that affect things in the long term. 
kind of historical change we do not often uh, study as such. There are transitions, and of course, there is the absence of change, homeostasis. All these models of change uh, work in different ways, and we want to explore which of them are particularly useful for particular areas, particular fields, particular questions. Fifth issue is uh, the issue of agency. There are agential uh, models of historical change that focus on the agency of particular individuals, groups, and communities in affecting change. And there are non-agential models of historical uh, change that do not depend on the particular uh, agency of uh, individuals or groups. And we want to explore, are agential models better for particular forms of historical change? For example, are agential models more relevant for political change than they are for economic change? Or is this misleading? Final issue, the issue of space. As we all know, Greek history is a very peculiar kind of history. Roman history is the history of the Roman state in its various uh, stages of development. Egyptian history is the history of the pharaonic state in its various uh, stages. Greek history is not the history of a single state, a single society, a single economy, but the history of a system of communities spread around the Aegean, the Mediterranean, and the Black Sea. Um, how exactly, given the existence of these hundreds of communities, can we see patterns of historical change that affect not a single community, but many of them? In what ways did these things happen and affected so many communities at the same time? So these are some kind of questions um, we would like to explore in the course of this uh, conference. Uh, we can uh, debate them and hopefully end up with some important um, conclusions uh, and findings in the course of the conference. Final thing to say before I finish, I forgot to thank our um, the Martinos Foundation, our very generous uh, sponsors that uh, ensured happened and would have happened even better had we been able to uh, hold the conference uh, live. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Uh, Uh, of Greek history in the land. We've lost Costas for some. We've lost Costas. Well, uh, we all. Thank Kostas Lasopoulos and Katerina Panagopoulou uh, for this uh, personal and impersonal introduction, I would say, uh, to the whole subject. Uh, it is very useful to recall all the uh, achievements of John Davis, also as uh, threads that uh, other others have continued and will continue uh, in the future. Also in respect to change, there is indeed a connection with uh, the notion of change and his work. Uh, and uh, I think now we could uh, uh, use the, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the 15 minutes uh, left uh, for the discussion uh, according to the program we have all seen uh, for short interventions, uh, remarks, and so on uh, on John Davis and change as a notion. Uh, I would only uh, venture to add uh, um, a remark myself uh, just as the a beginning, that this whole colloquium is on change, but uh, if there is uh, a use and a value in historiography, this is uh, an effort against things being altered or changed. Uh, Herodotus phrase about me exitela gineta, eh? 
is very important. Uh, and in this respect, uh, this colloquium about change uh, is also a tribute to a not changing uh, connection uh, and relation of John Davis, uh, not only to his studies, but also to the persons uh, with whom he has been connected in his life. And uh, the unchanged loyalty uh, to John Davis is also an important subtitle uh, of this colloquium in my eyes. Well, uh, if someone uh, would like to add something uh, on John Davis' uh, contribution or on the various uh, aspects of the problematic already uh, and uh, ably posed by uh, Costas, uh, one could speak perhaps uh, in the uh, about 15 minutes we have left until the end of this part of the colloquium. Please, uh, <clears throat> if you wish to add something, raise your hand or... Uh, uh, you can always put a cursor on your name. Yes. Uh, and uh, every panelist uh, could uh, move the cursor on his name on the right side of the uh, uh, chat. And uh, by pressing his name, there are three uh, choices uh, presented. One says, raise hand. So please, if anyone wishes to add something, should you also use this feature? I see no raised eyebrows, but also no raised hands. Until now, please <laughs> become more active. <clears throat> if I could uh, just add uh, something about the Greek translation of uh, John's book, uh, even to students, to uh, undergraduate students who uh, practically don't know a thing about Athens, his book uh, is uh, met uh, with uh, actually enthusiasm since uh, uh, as they say, as students say, everything is very clear, crystal clear regarding uh, Athens and uh, uh, life in Athens during the classical period. So uh, I would like also to thank you, John, for, for this. And uh, I think that uh, Greek students are now wiser after reading uh, uh, his book on Athens and classical democracy. Thanks, Yanis. Uh, any other intervention? I would also then like to, to mention uh, the remarks on his teaching at Liverpool uh, conveyed to me by uh, our former students uh, sent in delegations to Abercrombie Square, uh, that uh, they were impressed also by the fact uh, that uh, John Davis is one of the really, uh, of the real historians of classical antiquity in its entirety. Uh, we live all in an age of specialists, and this has its good rights and uses, but uh, to be able to cover uh, with real ability and a penetrating uh, mind uh, various uh, phases of ancient history is not a simple thing. Uh, I remember, I still remember remarks by Katerina Panagopoulou and Nikos Yanakopoulos on John Davis uh, giving lectures on late antiquity uh, at Liverpool and being able to deal with the very uh, diverse and intricate questions of this period in his teaching. This is also something very important. This was a practical 
uh, facing of change uh, in antiquity, uh, in a sense. Uh, someone else would like perhaps to, to offer some contribution to this part of the discussion. I'm sure that there must be many people uh, from uh, those whom I see on the screen uh, that have come into personal contact with uh, Davis' contributions. There is a question from one of the attendees. Okay. Who is... Uh, I don't see... Who is... Constantina Katsari. Constantina Katsari. Oh, yes. Ah. Constantina Katsari, if I may mention this, is one of the Athenian Erasmians sent uh, to uh, John Davis. Uh. The Professor Brazelis, in order for attendees to talk, you need to, uh, yes. to put the cursor on their name and allow them to talk. Uh, I cannot find the name. Oh, okay. Uh, Danny, uh, could you help me, perhaps? Yes, yes, talking, I'll do it. Talking permitted. It's okay. It's talking is permitted now. Yes, I think I'm unmuted. Right? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Katerina, yeah. we are listening to you. Hi, John. Very nice to see you after all these years. Um, I, I just wanted to make a, a comment because I was one of the, I think I was the second team of students who left Athens in order to go to Liverpool after Katerina. So I was uh, with uh, Yanakopoulos uh, and uh, we took together a, a course on uh, Roman history, surprisingly, uh, because uh, John, you're a predominantly Greek historian. However, I have to say that you have influenced my writings immensely because uh, um, I took some of the most basic principles that you had over social mobility and uh, uh, the structure of the Roman economy. And uh, I have used it in my model after all these years. So a big thank you to you for all your teachings and uh, all your um, encouragement, uh, which came in many forms when we were just uh, 20 year old students all alone in Liverpool. Thank you. We thank you, Constantina, for this intervention. This was uh, a precious addition, I would say, uh, just to show that uh, a real ancient historian should cover many fields. Uh, and feel uh, intended, I would say, uh, to deal with questions from many fields of ancient, ancient history. Because finally, we have uh, perhaps too much the tendency to parcel ancient history, too much. Uh, any other remark, intervention would be welcome. Uh, Nikos Yanakopoulos. Okay. So, yes, Nikos. Okay. You have the word. Good morning. Uh, I would, since we are on this topic, I would like to confirm what uh, Katerina and uh, you and uh, Konstantina just uh, said. Uh, so, I, I, I'm a little embarrassed, but <laughs> just a personal uh, memory. Uh, Professor Davis was a, a really impressive lecturer, right? Uh, he, he was really attractive. Uh, he was uh, someone uh, you listen to, and uh, for a 20 year old, 25 year old, uh, okay, the message was that I, I want to become like him. Uh, so uh, I remember that uh, when I, I attended the first uh, lecture, uh, I wanted to find a book. Uh, written by Professor Davis. Uh, I couldn't find a, a book on Roman history. And uh, I was really, uh, this was really very strange because uh, in front of me, there was a person, a professor, a teacher uh, who knew so, uh, so much on Roman history. And uh, I found uh, the book published in Fontana, History of Democracy in Classical Greece. I, I bought it the next day. I went to a uh, bookstore, I bought it uh, the next day. And uh, this was really influential, uh, not only for me, but for others 
students as well. I remember talking about this book and leading this book uh, when I uh, came back uh, to Greece. Uh, I gave this book uh, to friends of mine uh, in order to read it. Uh, so just this uh, short comment on uh, how influential uh, our my short uh, brief contact with uh, Professor Davis, brief contact in person was. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Uh, other interventions, contributions? Katerina Panakopoulou. Katerina, please. Just to follow up on this, because uh, okay, your, your, uh, the uh, next um, group, the, the, the next year you attended um, uh, Roman history, uh, I attended uh, a, a fantastic course on Delphi, um, uh, which I still remember. This is one of the best things I have ever heard um, as, a, as a student and ever since. I think that course and a course on temples and sanctuaries was on a, a seminal um, uh, paradigm as to how to organize wholly um, um, a course on uh, Greek history. So I just wanted to say this and thank you, John, for this. No other hands. Would, could I please have a brief word? Yes, of course. of course. I really, I think it is appropriate that I should thank everybody who has made such kind remarks um, about my teaching. Um, and I think they are very much appreciated precisely because I think I, I have teaching very much in my blood. My father was a teacher, my grand, my mother was a teacher, my grandmother was a teacher, both, both my grandmothers were teachers. It is in my blood and the instinct there to try to be clear, to try to understand where one's students or one's potential readers of the book are coming from and what they need to know is very much ingrained in me. So um, what you say is very much appreciated and I thank you. I might perhaps add to what Yanis Sidopoulos has just said that um, yes, indeed, democracy in classical Greece um, was an interesting effort. It is now, I think itself, very much out of date and needs um, to be improved, but I don't think a publisher will want to. But also, and he will appreciate this particularly, um, in any third edition, it absolutely needs an extra chapter on Northern Greece, which um, in the 1970s was not the subject of enormous interest, which it has now become. But that is all part of the way in which really anything that happens anywhere near the Mediterranean from let us say 1000 BC until the Islamic conquest is something which ought to be of interest to anybody who calls herself an ancient historian, even if um, inevitably one cannot do more than express an interest and a curiosity, but that is really the, the pleasure as well as the, the duty or the, the task as employees. It is the pleasure of our job to be able to explore this 1500 years of complicated human history and to try to understand what is happening to them. Thank you, Costas, well, both Costas, for Aselis and for Sopolos and others for, for what you have said so far. Thank you. We all thank you, John. And let me say uh, the fact that, if I'm not mistaken, many younger ancient historians, younger than the generation of uh, Katerina Panagopoulou, Kostas Vlasopoulos, Christina Kostasakopoulou, Nikolina Kopoulos, uh, are attending now uh, this conference on the web is a rare possibility for them uh, to have a sample of your teaching 
because uh, the way it remains, uh, the way you are teaching remains the same, and it is as appealing as it used to be. This is uh, <laughs> something that will go uh, with you always, I think. Well, uh, uh, with the organizers, uh, we could convene, I think, if there are no other uh, remarks to be made in this part, we might go on with the sequel, what is foreseen. Costas, I am uh, asking we, for we, help here. Just, just two things. First thing, um, if you want to ask a question, basically you click on the participants uh, tab and mm -hmm. at, the, at the lower right of the participants pa uh, the tab, there is uh, a, a button which says raise hand. So you click that button and uh, the, um, the uh, convenience of each panel uh, will give you uh, the, the right to speak at some point. Please remember once you have talked to put down your hand uh, to make the, the, the job of the, um, the, the, the panel chairs uh, easier. Uh, second thing, we've left after each paper, a 15-minute break so that, uh, you know, we can sort out the technicalities of uploading uh, PowerPoint presentations and so on. So we'll take the next few minutes uh, to sort out those technicalities and uh, we'll start at, uh, what, 11.45 Greek uh, time. But just to know that after every single paper, we have a short break. Uh, so that uh, we manage to, to maintain things in order and we can start always uh, on time. If I understand correctly, for the next uh, 12 minutes, we shall have a break. And after yes, all, we have we a short begin. break uh, while we sort out the technicalities of the next presentation. Okay. Uh, if Maid Koiv is with us... He will be... The first speaker. The first speaker. Uh, and okay. I just want to ask if Maid has a presentation. Maid, do you have a presentation? Yes, yes, I do. Okay. So basically, uh, you click the button. Uh, if, you, if you put the cursor on the screen, you will see a, a green button which says yes. share screen. Yes. You need, you need first to open the PowerPoint presentation in your computer. And then once you click the share screen, you will see the PowerPoint and uh, it will share uh, your screen is it now visible exactly yes okay well. okay then uh, after circa 10 minutes we are coming back uh, to the screens okay okay all right Costa cubo me pistevo etsi borume siga siga na ξεκινούμε κάνε την έχει κολλήσει πάλι η οθόνη του Κώστα αχα Καμία αντίρρηση να ξεκινήσουμε. Okay. Well. Έχουμε δύο λεπτάκια ακόμα, κύριε Βουραζέλη. Ε, το, το, το δικό μου το ρολόι λέει ε, παρατέταρτο ακριβώς. Α, εντάξει, ωραία, ωραία. Εγώ πιστεύω και 45 Greek time. Ωραία, ωραία. ωραία. Well, uh, let us begin then uh, our first session. Uh, I just wanted to comment shortly as an introduction that I find it very appropriate uh, that the first two speakers uh, during uh, uh, the panel uh, we are presiding with Yanis Xidopoulos uh, belong uh, or originate, if you like, from minor uh, European nations. The one is an Estonian who is going to speak, and the next one, Van Vez, if I'm not mistaken, is a Dutch. Uh, two small nations with a big tradition uh, of polis, of cities, both of them. Uh, and this is also something that becomes very much the whole work uh, of John Davis. Uh, uh, and um, I find it a very lucky coincidence that it is like this. Well, uh, just a few words on our first speaker, Mike Cove, 
uh, I'm not sure that I'm pronouncing it correctly, uh, is Associate Professor of Ancient History at the University of Tartu, as you see uh, on the screen. Uh, it is the first time I'm going to, to listen to him myself, but I find it very interesting that his interests span the earliest ages uh, of ancient Greek history, uh, that he has already published a, a book on the formation of some uh, early Greek states, city-states, especially if I'm not mistaken, uh, Argos, uh, Corinth, and uh, I don't remember the Sparta. third one. Sparta. And Sparta, right. Uh, and uh, in this respect, uh, he's also innerly connected with an important aspect of uh, John Davis. Ever. Well, dear Mike Kuyv, uh, you have the word. Uh, you, I think, listen to me. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, first, I would very much to thank uh, the organizers for doing this great job, despite all these obstacles we, which we have had here, and uh, express my gratitude of being able before such an honorable board to express or to, to explain my somewhat unorthodox, perhaps, views on them. Uh, social political development uh, in the early Greece. And now to the subject. Uh, this um, change, political change, um, uh, can be, of course, very easily um, characterized as, as uh, development from uh, late Bronze Age Palatian monarchies to classical polis. Uh, there was first a uh, notable simplification of the political order brought by the 12th century collapse. Then uh, very simple, so to say, pre-state communities during the early Iron Age, and then increasing complexity from the 8th century onwards, which uh, eventually produced the classical polis, which everybody knows, of course. Uh, in these classical polis, very simply put, there uh, were different criteria of political participation, um, but in any case, they were citizen communities. Uh, they can be divided, Indeed, were divided already in, in antiquity uh, between or as identified as oligarchies, democracies. In the fourth century, the number of these uh, oligarchies and the democracies was more or less equal. Aristotle judges it's in that way, and and um, Morgan's Hansen has counted it in the same way. So, but what is the point? I mean, uh, the most important thing I think is that. Um, uh, be they oligarchies or democracies. In any case, they were comparatively democratic, comparatively egalitarian communities compared to the early state communities in the whole world. Uh, so we can see uh, here somewhat different uh, development for the most early state, state um, societies. Uh, usually, the increase of complexity produces um, strongly increased hierarchies, strong elite power. While in Greece, the, the elite power was clearly restricted, uh, not only compared to the big empires in the East or wherever, but also compared to the city-states in the Near East or city-states in the Western Mediterranean. And this, I think, is something we, we must explain. Uh, and um, and uh, this is uh, what I will discuss here. Why, how, when did this comparatively egalitarian political system emerge? Uh, was it a recent creation before the classical period? Or rather, had it been, or had the communities been comparatively egalitarian already long before that? So my subject would, will be a social political change. That is the development of power relations within, within the communities. Uh, of course, I can only draw the general lines. I cannot discuss uh, the details, uh, which I know are disputable. Um, uh, but this general, uh, these general lines. Uh, what we know, there was uh, this collapse, which I mentioned. Then 
at circa 1000 before Christ. Uh, that was as put by in the recent book of um, Christoph Wolf and, uh, and Eric Christler, uh, sort of egalitarian zero point. So clear um, uh, the reduction of uh, the hierarchies, but nevertheless, there is the usual assumption that the starting point for understanding the further, further development of the early Iron Age and classical Greece uh, is always or is always understood as, as a sort of um, uh, elite domination, aristocratic society. Uh, the early Iron Age communities are almost always understood as dominated by some elite leaders. Um, well, Ian Morris has, of course, thought that uh, already during the 8th century there was some sort of revolution which reduced the elite dominance. But most scholars, I think, won't agree and would rather say that uh, the formation of police from the 8th century forward was a sort of elite business from which the common people were more or less excluded. And only thereafter, during the archive period, there of complete revolution or whatever, um, uh, there was uh, such a decline of the elite domination and the increase of the um, social and political significance of the common. Uh, now, when uh, thinking um, uh, the basis uh, of uh, this uh, very usual view, then I think two points can be brought forward. First, indeed, the Aristotelian view, which we all know, heroic kingship, early aristocracies, middle constitutions, tyrannies paving way for democracy and then democracies. And uh, Aristotle also connected them with different ways of warfare, as I indicated here on this, on this picture. Uh, so I am pretty sure that um, Today, most of the scholars will not accept this at, at the face value. Um, and um, it's the right thing to do, I'm sure, because as far as I know, this concept was never um, stated before Aristotle. In all likelihood, it, it is or it was an Aristotelian invention. Um, and therefore, um, of course, the scholars won't um, so exactly agree with Aristotle. But I feel so that. In some way, this concept still looms on the background, and it still has the influence, and the people still tend to look at the things in the way as Aristotle has proposed. And the other point is Homeric evidence, because we all know that uh, Homer presented a clearly aristocratic um, society, um, elite heroes doing great things on the battlefield, on the assemblies, in the assemblies. Uh, and the common people are always on the background, passive, in, in, insignificant. And this vision, this Homeric society, is um, very often accepted as some sort of um, real uh, presentation of real world. Uh, this uh, Homeric world is dated sometimes to the Iron Age, some, some, sometimes to the 8th century, sometimes to the early 7th century. Uh, but uh, always accepted as some sort of starting point. Uh, well, I cannot discuss, of course, here a American question, uh, but uh, I can express my uh, skepticism because clearly the dating is uncertain, and the later date we will accept for the American poems, the more difficult it would be to accept uh, this American world as a presentation of the real world of the poet. Uh, we must very seriously count that it was a poetic and chronological amalgam. And in any case, I think, we must accept that uh, there was a very strong aristocratic bias. Uh, so in all likelihood, Homer presents the world um, not as it was in the reality, but as the elite men wished it to see. And uh, we can say that the Homeric world is so an aristocratic ideal um, projected back into a legendary past. And therefore, what I will propose here is um, uh, looking at the evidence without these two preconceptions and without uh, accepting the Aristotelian view and without accepting the Homeric world as a such um, closed entity, as a um, such definite starting point. Uh, and uh, so I begin with the social position of um, the elite and the common people. Um, 
when we look at this uh, evidence from Homer, I think in this respect, we may rely on Homer to some extent, because uh, uh, this is a side of the Homeric world, which was uh, the least affected by the heroic tradition, and therefore like to present the, truly the, the um, uh, contemporary realities. Uh, and uh, take the, the evidence of Homer and Hesiod. And what we see there, of course, there was a lead. The elite was not exploiting the local farmers. The elite was exploiting the moist slaves, territory, day laborers, mainly, uh, mainly uh, slaves. Uh, the people indeed brought, uh, brought uh, gifts to, uh, to this elite, but uh, there is no indication that these gifts were a regular obligation. And uh, at least in one passage, uh, it's quite clear that, that every soldier was supposed to have oikos and kleros. So uh, soldiers were imagined as some sort of small group. Uh, and uh, Hesiod uh, very much composed with this vision. Uh, again, Basileus, the elite, um, but uh, the farmers like Hesiod, whichever was exactly their social position, uh, were independent economic, economically uh, from, of these uh, Basileis. There is no sign that they were in way indebted towards the Basileis or had to would be taxed, were taxed by the Basileis. No, uh, they brought gifts, but only in the cases of the court. And uh, what is also, I think, very important, they exploited uh, the very same kind of dependent level, the Moes and uh, Erita, which means that in this, say, Homeric Hesiodic world, whatever exactly it is, uh, uh, we see uh, the elite men and the farmers, let's say common people, uh, as uh, some sort of independent actors. No ties of dependency between them. Uh, and when we now will ask what was this um, uh, economic status of the common man, then of course we cannot exactly say because uh, the position of Hesiod is indisputable. But fortunately, we do have uh, evidence from the end of the archive period. Uh, this is given for us by Herodotus, uh, who gave the numbers of hoplites in the Battle of Plataea. And here I bring um, uh, two examples, uh, which I think may indicate the social structure of the late archive states. Uh, first, uh, Orchomenos in, in Arcadia, a uh, small polis. Uh, which produced uh, 600 tons. Uh, so more or less, let's say 600 plots. These plots must have been accommodated on this space, which you can see on the screen. Uh, and uh, I will not go into the details, but if we will assume that uh, about a third of the land was um, possessed by uh, about 10% of the wealthier families, then uh, the result would be that uh, an average uh, small code and average hoplite as a small code that would have had um, slightly more than 600, uh, six hectares. And uh, an elite family could have had 25 hectares. But in any case, you, if you look at this picture, you can, I think, very clearly see that you simply cannot accommodate on this space very big land holders. And if there were so such a huge, amount of small landholders, then the big landholders could only have been small, comparatively small. And uh, when we look at the evidence from Corinth, we can see a similar picture. Uh, using, using the same method, 5,000 hoplites, um, uh, it will produce even smaller plots for hoplites, um, 4,7 hectares, and uh, for these elite families, uh, 18 hectares. Well, of course, I understand that all this is a um, hypothetical calculation, surely, and there can be slightly different calculations, surely. But the point is that the land holding pattern in any case must have been egalitarian, comparatively egalitarian. And the big land holding simply could not have been very big at the end of the archaic period. Uh, now, of course, I know that, that uh, there is the survey evidence which suggests that uh, do, at the end of the archaic period, uh, some marginal land was um, taken into um, under cult cultivation, and therefore the number of the smallholders could have increased, etc. That's true. 
But I think it's hardly likely that I come back to this picture that uh, that uh, most of these hoplites, uh, uh, five thousand in this uh, small space, had their lands on the margins. I cannot believe this. Most of them must have had their lands uh, on the plain. And if they had the lands on the plain, then uh, for assuming a notable increase of the landed plots during the archaic period, we should assume a, a true redistribution of the landed property on the plains. That is a true social revolution. And we must, of course, ask, do we, ha do we have any evidence of this? So I think the best thing to do would be to assume, accept that in all likelihood, this um, comparatively egalitarian uh, landholding pattern and uh, therefore restricted hierarchies, restricted landholdings of the elite pertain to the whole archaic period, more or less. And in that case, it's very likely that this landholding pattern was inherited from the early Iron Age. And uh, the next thing to ask would be, is it likely that these smallholders were virtually excluded from political participation. I think it's not likely. And I will now count uh, some very well-known evidence. I am sure everybody knows this. Uh, first, uh, a few of the earliest inscriptions. The inscription from Dreros um, regulating the reiteration of the office of Cosmos. What is important here? The decision was made by Polis. Well, in this case, we cannot tell what the police actually was. Was it an assembly or was it not an assembly? It's disputable. Uh, police as um, this acting identity is, uh, is stated in many other Cretan inscriptions. Uh, we know that. So uh, here uh, the question is uh, not clear, but in the next inscriptions, which I uh, note here, it, it is clear uh, because in Turin's the inscription more or less contemporary with the inscription from Dreros, we see that uh, some officials should act as the people have decided. And there is also some notice of, um, of um, assembly. The inscription is fragmentary and therefore it's not quite clear what this aliyah exactly has to do with this opinion of, uh, of people, of Thomas, but uh, no likelihood they were connected. So in this case, we can be pretty sure that uh, the decisions uh, were made by Thomas in the assembly. And now coming to uh, the, again, very well-known uh, inscription from Hios, which is usually discussed and discussed because of the Bula de Mosia, here, noted here, but for me, more important is uh, again to note that uh, it were the ordinances of the people, demo retras, which had to be um, present guarded, demo retras philasa. And some important uh, steps uh, or things must have been done. Again, we cannot tell exactly what because uh, the inscription again is very fragmentary. But something very important must have been done when the people have assembled. Demo Clemeno. So again, in all likelihood, the people, um, the people uh, assembly makes the, uh, the final decisions. Now I come to the next evidence. The, again, all my evidence uh, is uh, very well known. I'm, I'm sure. Uh, the great retra of Sparta, uh, the pronouncement uh, from archaic period. The date is disputable and I will not dispute it here. Uh, but I, I think everybody would, uh, would agree that this is archaic and uh, rather earlier than late. Uh, and what we see, this is an arranged as an act of foundation. First part establishes um, uh, such um, uh, the state cults, uh, then structural units, then Gerusia, and as the final act of this set of establishments is the regularity of the as assemblies. And it's very clearly stated as the, the such purpose or final, final, final act to be done. Having done this, having done this, having done this, oras ex oras appellatsen, that is, have regular assemblies. And then the second part of this retro, 
statement of her procedure. And uh, the statement states very clearly the ultimate power must belong to the people. Of course, we do not know what this uh, Gamot Angoria name and here, which is a clear corruption, uh, meant, but the commentary of Aristotle makes it, I think, um, clear beyond this discussion that, that uh, this must have concerned the right of the people. So, uh, Retra establishes the regularity of the assemblies. This seems to be the main, main intention and the ultimate, um, ultimate power of the people. There comes, of course, the right. Uh, according to Aristotle, a later invention, most modern scholars probably disagree, mm, but we don't know. Uh, and uh, this uh, states that if the people speak crookedly, they could be dissolved. Of course, the right of the people, which is stated in this retraism, um, diminished, let us say so. But what is important is that uh, this writer presumes that the right of the people to, to say something and to decide is some sort of normalcy. And this must be checked. That is, it, it assumes some sort of traditional right of the people to, ha to have power. And next, again, very well known, Tertius, uh, the Eunomia. Uh, this uh, has no democratic intention, of course. Uh, it is an exhortation to follow the leaders, the kings and the elders. But nevertheless, it assumes that the people have the right of decision. Uh, of course, the leadership should belong to the Basileis and Gerontes, or, yeah, Gerontes. Uh, but then the common men should respond to with the uh, straight retra or to the right straight retra. This is disputable. Well, therefore, I will not go into this discussion. But uh, they must say with haste what is good. So they have some right of, of saying something. And the final uh, statement again let the people have victory and power. The mude plate, niken, kakartus, So um, uh, again, clear assumption. Despite, uh, despite the ideology, which was not to, to, to um, emphasize the right of the people. No, it emphasizes the leadership, but it assumes the right of the people. Uh, and so, uh, somewhat um, intermediate conclusion. This is the earliest evidence we have. And in all these, uh, these pieces of evidence, we see that uh, the right of the people to pass final decision was more or less assumed as some sort of um, re reality, some sort of traditional reality. Now, uh, of course, we do not know who made up these people. Was it big circle or, or, or small circle? No, and um, uh, we cannot tell how the power relations within these communities were really established, uh, how they, this worked in practice. This is unknown for us. Uh, but which, what I wish to point out is that we have no reason first, or at least this, this evidence itself gives us no reason to assume that, that uh, the circle was very, very, very confined, very narrow. Uh, no reason to assume that always this formal right of decision was only formal. It could well have been real. And above all, very often uh, the moderns explain this evidence in a way, a way by saying that, well, we see here the first instances when the people assert the power, uh, assume that uh, this was already a result of some sort of change that previously this right was not so big, but now it is for that first time so, so big. But this evidence gives no slightest indication for that. And why should we think so? And therefore, what I would suggest is that, that the most logical conclusion would be that this um, uh, right of the people is inherited from the early period, from the early Iron Age. And now I come to, to the uh, perhaps crucial evidence that some change in the Salonian Athens. And uh, here, 
I think um, uh, the Aristotelian influence is most clearly felt. Uh, the Aristotelian view presented by the Athenian Politeia is quite clear indeed. First, the political order before Solon was oligarchic in every respect. Um, the archons were um, selected according to excellence and wealth, Aristinden, Kaiputinden, uh, no mention of assembly, and the multi multitude, the poloi had share in nothing, were enslaved by the few, all the land was in the hands of the few. Um, all, it's not cl quite clearly said, but uh, it is implied that the people, or at least most of the people were indebted. Uh, and uh, anyway, the people were enslaved by the rich, uh, they could have been sold abroad, etc. So. In every respect, uh, the elite dominated. That's quite clearly the Aristotelian view, no doubt. And then Solon became the first champion of the demos. He liberated the, the people by um, canceling the debts, etc., and uh, established some sort of moderate constitution, therefore made the first step towards the um, democracy. And as far as I know, the moderns usually almost exactly follow this Aristotelian description. But should we? And uh, we must therefore ask about the reliability of the Aristotelian evidence. What evidence could Aristotle or whoever in the classical and later periods have had concerning the real situation before Solon? And when we will ask that question, I think uh, the answer will be clearly negative. And I will point, uh, point out some, some uh, well, the time is running short, therefore I, I, I more or less skip this. Uh, that clearly were different opinions. Uh, I wish to point out here, uh, there was uh, the view of uh, uh, democracy established by Theseus, which I don't think is a rea reality, of course, but it, which demonstrates quite clearly that very different views were current. Aristotelian view was by no means the, the only view which was accepted in the classical Athens. And when we go to the details, then we view that uh, truly the later authors did not know the constitution or the situation in the early Athens. And what they could base on was uh, principally the poetry of Solon, which they quoted and which we therefore have. And therefore the, the obvious conclusion would be that, that we cannot rely on this Aristotelian view, which is I mean, first derivative and uh, next very strongly influenced by this Aristotelian con concept. But we must rely almost exclusively on the poetry of Solon. And when we do this, then the picture will emerge very different. Uh, what we see first, Solon clearly blamed the rich, there is no doubt. That was the hubris of the leaders, which has caused the crisis. Uh, the, the, uh, the rich people failed to guard the sacred foundations of Teak. They uh, go rich persuaded by their unjust deeds. They steal right and left. And this has caused the, the, the uh, slavery of the, of, the, uh, of the people. So they clearly act contrary to the wish of the gods. And that in all likely means, in all likelihood means that they were acting contrary to the the tradition, because God's God, traditional order. No, and, and then uh, when Solon said what he did, then he, he clearly said he did not promote any part more than less, uh, more or less, uh, the more than it was appropriate, and therefore more than it was tradition. So uh, Solon clearly presents himself as a conservative, not, not a revolution. And when we go to this land reform, as described by Solon, then what we see, uh, land was, of course, enslaved by the horror implanted on it. The people were enslaved, uh, either sold away or in slavery at home. And what Solon uh, made, the, uh, removed the horror, liberated the land, liberated the people. Uh, but he did not allow plunder, which means that the liberation of the land was not plundered. And that means that the liberation of the land was, did not affect the rightful possessions of the rich, which means again that the ancestral 
possessions of the rich were not touched. So uh, the, this uh, land marked by horror was, was this land which was acted by unjust thieves, by stealing. So it was not possessed traditionally. And Solon, as he himself presents, his, his case simply returned the land to their traditional owners. That is how Solon presents the case. And when we then come to the political side of uh, how it was presented by Solon, then we can see that, that uh, Solon assumes that Demos traditionally possessed females. That is political rights. And here the fragment five, according to West, is crucial. To the people I gave so many privileges, privileges as is sufficient. Well, here we can dispute what was sufficient. But the next, neither taking away their Timae nor overextending. Well, if Timae could have been taken away, there must have been traditional Timae of the people, otherwise it simply could not have been taken away. They're quite clear. So uh, Solon, Solon again confirmed, according to his own point of view, confirmed what traditionally belonged to the people. And when we would ask uh, what did uh, these people, demos contain, what kind of, how big a circle of people there was among these demos, then we find no sign uh, in Solon that anybody would have been excluded. I cannot go here into details, but all the Athenians, rich, um, the, all, also these Athenians who were enslaved were in principle the part of the demos. So uh, Solon's own picture was that he, checked the traditional use of power by the elite, restored the enslaved land to the rightful owners, and confirmed the traditional time of the of demos. And when in the end now, that's uh, before conclusion, my last, last part, I come to this Homeric evidence, then we, I think, can see that the, despite the aristocratic bias of, uh, of the uh, poet, he clearly assumed that the people uh, have significance. Uh, the, the masses of people are always on the background in the battlefields. Of course, so the heroes do the great text on the foreground. Well, they were heroes after all. But, um, uh, but the people are always there in close form. Assemblies, Agorai, are very regular, uh, a sign, a mark of civilized life, according to the Odyssey. Decisions are, uh, when they were important decisions, are always confirmed by the loud approval of the people. Nobody was, no indication that anybody would have been excluded from the assemblies. And at least in a couple of uh, cases, uh, the responsibility of the people is clearly pointed out. Uh, first case is when Achilles accused, uh, well, after his quarrel with Agamemnon, when the assembly did not support his case, he clearly accused the assembly, the, the Achaeans, of not restricting Agamemnon. And even more clearly, even more clearly in the second uh, song of uh, the Odyssey, when uh, Te um, uh, Telemachus uh, uh, asked the assembly of Ithaca to, swap, to check the suitors of Penelope, and uh, the people did not respond, then mentor vehemently accused the people for their inactivity. So clearly the activity of the people was expected. And then the very last thing before conclusion, the right to argue against the leaders. Uh, here we all know this uh, Tersites case, who criticized um, Achilles, no, sorry, Agamemnon, and, and um, I have written here wrongly, uh, sorry, uh, uh, criticized Agamemnon uh, and, uh, and was uh, thereafter ridiculed by, by, um, by um, uh, the poet and then beaten down by, by Odysseus. Uh, of course he was ridiculed and silenced, but the very fact that such Tersites needs to be presented and ridiculed, it seems to point out, suggest that uh, such, such tersita were a constant annoyance, which must have been ridiculed, must have been silenced. 
And when we would ask uh, if uh, these uh, tercitae were traditional or not traditional, then we know that very often it's said that, well, we, here we see the first time where the man from the people steps forward and etc. But the poet gives no indication that it, this was untraditional. Absolutely. These tercitae could have been uh, active throughout the early Iron Age and troubled the leaders. And if we wish, we could even reconstruct a, a reverse scenario, saying that Tercites was traditional. And this here, here we can see the first time when some of this was beat it down, such traditional Tercites. Well, I do not suggest that this is necessarily the case, but uh, I wish to point out that the poem itself does not give any evidence this way or that way. And so now I come to the conclusion. Uh, we, what we can see, probably a compar comparatively egalitarian landholding pattern and restricted social uh, hierarchies, economically independent smallholders, inherited from the early Iron Age. Then we can see uh, that uh, there was, of course, increasing elite pressure, but this was checked as Solon did, returned what belonged to the demos. Uh, and uh, so I can see uh, any radical change during the archive period, actually. And uh, the same concerns the political order. Assemblies indicated from our uh, very earliest evidence, the people had the final say from our early, from the uh, earliest evidence we do have. And there are also indications that the commoners could have criticized the leaders. So I cannot see any reason for assuming uh, exclusive elite power during the early phase of Greek history. And therefore, the, when describing the change, uh, this, I think, would be that first collapse, then egalitarian zero point at circa 1000, then restricted hierarchies, modest, modest elites, smallholders, uh, probably various leadership patterns. We can also assume that many early Iron Age communities were ruled collectively. We don't know such. Uh, then increasing elite ambition from the 8th century onwards. Uh, but, and then of course, uh, attempts to submit the common, commoners to exploitation, uh, manifestation of elite power. I think Tyranny's monarchy was a clear manifestation of elite power uh, in the early Greece. Uh, but uh, the crucial point is that the smallholders were able to protect their position, to check the increase of the elite power uh, because of their traditional rights, which probably were inherited from the learners. And therefore, of course, um, uh, the, uh, that, uh, as an additional factor, also the Oplid phalanx came into play, which did not increase the importance of the common people, but uh, had. Uh, gave them some additional, perhaps, uh, military weight, because uh, now the, the states depended on, on the number of the hoplites, and they simply could not allow the, such a smallholder class to be distinguished or extinguished. Uh, so uh, the result would be that the social, economic, and political status of the smallholders was preserved during the archaic period. And when we, uh, and therefore the, uh, the dynamics were variable vexation of political order, this way or that way. And it was quite natural because, because uh, the social uh, hierarchies were shallow, elite was comparatively weak, therefore not able to assert its power definitely, and the commoners were relatively strong. And clearly this balance, uh, shaky balance produced um, variations volatility. And uh, this, uh, as a result, uh, the classical polis, uh, which uh, were growing, uh, were resulting from the growing institutionalization, uh, established a variable constitution. The, so to say, mixed constitutions, I think, would be the closest to this traditional average. Oligarchies could be understood as uh, the statement of elite power beyond what was traditional, and democracies were the statement of the power of demos beyond what was traditional. So that is what I wish to propose for discussion. Um, uh, and uh, I do very much thank you for the attention.
Thank you very much, uh, dear friend from Tartu. Uh, uh, I'm sure that this paper will spark uh, discussion. Uh, you have meant that, I'm sure. Uh, I like personally this idea of uh, express it in German, for the tyrum der Demokratie. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, this depends on the interpretation of uh, many uh, parts of, of your sources. Well, uh, I'm sure that there are uh, more competent people uh, in the screen audience uh, to uh, intervene. I see here that Kostas Vlasopoulos would like to comment. Yanni, if you have any other yes. uh, interventions announced, please let me know. Four participants. Well, let us begin with uh, Kostas Vlasopoulos or not? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Kostas, you have the Thank word. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you, mate, for a very fascinating paper. Uh, I will briefly say I'm in broad agreement with what you argued. Um, I think what has been happening over the last decade, there is a trend. Your work, the work of Hans, the work of uh, Alain Dupuis, are all challenging this idea that once upon a time in the Homeric or the early archaic period, there was an aristocracy with control over society and an aristocratic culture, and progressively you have a democratization of Greek societies. So I think it's quite essential to start from deconstruction. So to deconstruct a narrative of historical change, which is very problematic. The question is, once we do the deconstruction, uh, what do we put in its place? And I want to ask basically uh, you on this. How do you envisage uh, political change in the Greek world once we deconstruct the narrative, which I think you very rightly did? I get the impression, and I want your confirmation or negation of what I'm saying, that the way you think about it is basically less structural and more conjunctural. Uh, we don't see big structural uh, changes like the traditional narrative transition from aristocratic regimes into democratic regimes, more variations upon a theme, as you said, mixed constitutions been more or less the long-term uh, pattern and uh, democracies or oligarchies being variations uh, on that. And I get the impression that what I will be arguing when it comes down to social change is more or less the same, much more a huge amount of conjunctural change, but much less structural change uh, than uh, we tended uh, to think. Um, so I want to ask, do you see it like that? And B, whether yes or no, how do you envisage then political change uh, in uh, the, the long term? Yes, thank you. Uh, well, I do agree. Uh, yes, that uh, the uh, st general structure of the society did not, um, did not uh, change uh, so much during the long period of time. That uh, truly, as I said, I, I believe that, uh, that uh, such uh, smallholders uh, were dominating part of uh, of the communities, um, both uh, in the numbers, but also in the significance, uh, and uh, that uh, the elite, the elite men, well, the, uh, men are always egoistic. They wish to increase their their um, potentiality and so on. The elite, of course, always wish to to increase, to 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 subject uh, in that way or this way the, these common people, but. Uh, uh, this this um, um, inherited position and also economic position, the uh, owning of these land plots or possession of the land plots, uh, gave some social guarantee uh, to this uh, common this amount of common people who simply were able to protect themselves. Uh, that's that's true. And one one thing more, which is. Uh, uh, I need to point out in this respect, in social respect, is that from the very earliest sources, we see that the, the dependent labor force was acquired from outside. 
the American heroes did not exploit their own community members. They exploited slaves from outside. And, and therefore, I cannot see that uh, there was uh, such um, development as Moses Finley uh, envisioned uh, this, um, uh, that uh, first, during the archaic period, the main group exploited were their own community members, and then there was uh, the change towards the classical slavery. I do not quite believe this. Uh, so, uh, truly, the structural changes, I think, were um, pretty small. Now, political change. Uh, well, the main point, I think, is that uh, this is the progressive institutionalization. The power relations did not change much, but the way how they were institutionalized, the specification of functions, etc., uh, this, um, this um, yeah, of course, increased always. And, and uh, I think uh, also that this increase of the, say, different and divergent um, uh, possibilities, political possibilities um, uh, allowed uh, during the classical period uh, such more explicit uh, formation of the clearly uh, or doctrinal oligarchic governments and uh, clear democracies. So both sides in a way learned to, to, uh, to uh, confirm their power and uh, to establish a clear and relatively stable state mechanism of protecting, safeguarding their power. So that would be my, my answer. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there are further questions, if I'm not mistaken. Yanis, do you have the names? Yes, uh, Christy Kostantakopoulou first. Okay. Thank you, very Christy, yeah. Hi, you you Thank you very much for this uh, very clear uh, discussion. I have. I want to pick you up on one point. Um, what is your definition of elite? Because you presented an image where the smallholders are kind of fighting off the elite power. And I was thinking, what do you do with the population that is not smallholders? Yeah. Those who in the classical period um, have no land or very little land, so they're not in, in your kind of image. Where do these people come from? Because I think if you have a different uh, definition of elite, which includes the smallholders, suppressing a much larger population, which can be free or in debt or bondage or in, kind, in some kind of slave condition, then it's a slightly different image than the one you presented. Uh, thank you. Uh, well, of course, elite can be understood in very different ways. And, and uh, taking the example of classical Athens, of course, we can understand the whole citizenry as a sort of elite, uh, which in some sense uh, they were. Uh, now, uh, uh, these are numbers of um, hoplites in, this, um, in these communities, which I showed. Um, I think if we assume that uh, most of the hoplites were smallholders or landholders, uh, then uh, these numbers indicate uh, that um, uh, the circle possessing the lands and uh, so included into this group of, um, of smallholders was, must have been very large. And there, uh, there, of course, there could have been people who had also land, but possessed less land and therefore did not qualify as hobbits. Um, I do not think that these people necessarily were excluded. It's very often to, to uh, uh, such an idea that, uh, that there was some <coughs> hobbit census during the archaic period. Actually, when Sparta would be excluded, then I do not know any, any, uh, any evidence for that. At least I cannot imagine any evidence. So I think it's rather uh, a classical construct perhaps uh, during the late uh, 5th century uh, Athenian uh, oligarchic revolutions. Uh, so rather this than, uh, than uh, an archaic reality. Um, uh, so I do, truly, I do think that, uh, that uh, the people who, uh, who uh, possessed uh, small parts of land or even no land could well have been uh, also the members of the political community and the 
members sharing all the rights in principle. Uh, so what about the elite? Then, of course, I agree. Elite, um, it's very difficult to define. And, and uh, it, it depends, um, for example, on whether we consider how rich we consider to have been the Athenian Seugitai or Hesiod, were they elite men or not elite men? So inevitably, inevitably, uh, when we do not have such clear, um, undisputable uh, uh, statistical evidence, then we must use rather vague terms. And I, I admit I used elite in this vague, very vague term, wealthier families, but I cannot tell how many of these wealthier families there were. I think nobody can, and, and uh, how wealthy they actually were. I uh, tried to construct some, um, some possibilities according to the Hoplit numbers, but uh, this is, of course, a, a guess. Okay, thanks for your answer. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, our next speaker uh, <laughs> would also like to comment uh, on your presentation. Yeah. Uh, dear Hans, yes, please. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much, and uh, thank you, uh, Mike. For uh, I'm not sure I was first in the queue, but uh, give, since that you've given me the floor, I will ask my uh, questions. Um, no, thanks very much, Mike, uh, for a very um, uh, a strong uh, case that you've made. As, you, as you're aware, I've sort of made the opposite case almost. Um, so, if I made two two questions, two aspects of that. One is your very important claim that there's no um, exploitation as we're of the of the common farmer in in Homer. Um, there, I wonder um, what you do with the, the Thetes in, in, in Homer. Um, they're not mentioned very often, but their presence is clearly uh, assumed throughout. Um, so who are they, if not, if not relatively exploited free laborers? Uh, and who are they in, in, in uh, Solon's uh, property class where they, they f uh, system, where they form the, the, the bottom group? Um, so that's one question. The other is um, the demos, as I completely agree that there is a strong tradition of you know the demos being involved in public decision making of some kind of all kinds um but the key question is surely as you yourself said is you know who are the demos at any given time and uh, my argument would be that that actually does change uh, structurally over the over the centuries um case in point might be sparta which you use as an example the, the Spartan demos, at least, you know, in the classical period where we can uh, tell what they are, uh, are clearly not smallholders. You know, they're all um, leisured landowners. Um, and so one could perhaps argue that either one has to argue Sparta is the exception, or one could argue that maybe Sparta is uh, representative of a type of demos that existed in the archaic period more, more widely. So those two points, uh, Thetis and, and who the demos are. Uh, this, uh, thank you. These uh, theses, I think, are more or less uh, identical with this uh, Eritrea. I have understood in that way. Uh, well, they were, of course, there, and uh, they were also in Hesiod. Clearly, uh, Hesiod also exploited uh, such such men. Um, they, they, uh, well, I didn't, do not say that there was no exploitation. Of course, uh, when we take this uh, pre-Solonian Athens, according to the poems of uh, Solon, then quite clear there was exploitation. What I was suggesting that the exploitation was not something, uh, or in that amount, was not something inherited from the early Iron Age, but this was something which increased uh, during the archaic period uh, and was seen as untraditional. That is my point. So clearly there was, and probably there had always been some sort of exploitation, because uh, no society ever is absolutely egalitarian. We know that there were always uh, more well-to-do and less well-to-do people, and the less well-to-do people surely contained the persons who, who did not possess lands, so younger sons, for example, uh, when the farmer has many sons surviving, uh, and these uh, should have found some some earn something indeed and work for the others. Uh, what is important that uh, that they uh, did not uh, work only for the wealthy elite, but in all likelihood uh, they worked also for uh, perhaps for the men who were only slightly wealthier than they were. For example, in Hesiod we have um, a very interesting passage which is not very often commented upon that 
Hesiod uh, could have exploited as a wage laborer his, his neighbor, his friend. He uh, states that uh, the, the conditions or the agreement with the friend must be on the, on the equal standing or so. You must do a good agreement with your friend. So you could have, uh, could have earned um, uh, his own, um, well, his own friend principle. So uh, the difference be between uh, this uh, Eritos and and uh, the um, the person for whom he worked could have been rather small. Uh, but so so what I think is that this Tetas could have been of so uh, rather small group. I think. Um, and and uh, variable in that sense that uh, they could not necessarily have been so much um, below this uh, this uh, smallholders uh, because they could have in some cases uh, come from the very same families actually uh, the other thing the demos um, uh, well the question is of course. Uh, was Sparta typical or, or, or not? I think it was not typical. Uh, not only this uh, military, uh, military organization, but also the land holding pattern, because uh, Sparta was clearly a conquest state. And that is, uh, I think, uh, crucial. Uh, Spartans had conquered first the whole uh, Lacedaemon, the whole land, uh, this um, part. Uh, they were not originally uh, the holders of all this land. Most of the, uh, their um, clero came from, uh, from not uh, their original community, but from outside this. So they were expropriated from the others. And then the other part were, of course, in Messenia. So uh, they had a rather small group originally. The inhabitants of uh, the police of Sparta there in the northern part of uh, Lacedaemon. Uh, had a huge land resource, which they could divide among them. No other police had such huge land resource. And therefore we simply can, I think, uh, assume that uh, the uh, Spartans had more land to, in their dispositions and therefore the clero must have been much bigger than normal. And when we return to Athens then, uh, well, we know that the classical Athens had a comparatively egalitarian land holding pattern. And, and now, now the question is how could this uh, comparatively egalitarian land holding pattern have um, originated or how they, from where they, it came from? And if we assume that originally then well, there was some, in some sense, a very different land holding traditionally very different land holding pattern. Then we must assume that there was a huge social revolution. Of course, Aristotle assumed this, uh, clear. But, but uh, what I wish <laughs> I wished to point out is that uh, the Solon itself did not describe the things in that way. The Solon described the ways in the way, uh, the things in the way that originally, that he restored the original, original pattern. And if we would accept the Solonian view, then uh, we would say, uh, necessarily say that uh, there is no such obvious uh, revolution, obvious redistribution of land and lands, and therefore the logical conclusion would be that this comparatively egalitarian land holding pattern must be traditional. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, if I see correctly, uh, uh, a Solonian uh, specialist uh, would like to, to take the word. Uh, Edward Harris would like to, to comment also on your presentation. Um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. Edward. I cannot see you, but we can hear you. I don't know why. The, I'm sorry about the picture. Uh, I hope my voice is sufficient. Um, Matt, um, I must say I, I very much agree with the broad outlines of this. Uh, I wouldn't want to go into uh, details. Um, I, I think many of the points um, I think are very good. I'm, I'm glad to see that um, you think that Demoes, uh, as David Lewis and myself think, are their slaves. They're also playing a very important role. Um, there's no debt bondage in the uh, uh, there's no debt bondage in the uh, Salonia, uh, in the the pre area, this area. Um, the only thing I would just want to ask you about 
is that there's been a great deal of work done in surveys um, about land and the how much land, for instance, is actually being cultivated during the archaic period. And I just want to give you two examples. Um, uh, I'm not, if there are other archaeologists uh, in the audience, um, uh, please correct me uh, if I'm wrong. But I give one example, and that is the recent excavation, well, the recent survey work um, uh, done by uh, Sylvian Fauchard at the American School, who's now in Switzerland, in the Mazi Plain. And I talked to uh, him several times about this, and I said, how much of this land is being cultivated? This is the area right on the, almost the border between Attica and Boeotia. And he says, there's no, we can't find anything. There, there, are no, there's, there really doesn't seem to be any indication of habitation at all. The other area actually is also one which was excavated by uh, uh, Hans Lohmann um, in the 70s and 80s uh, down in Atene, which is the opposite end of Attica. And he also noticed the same thing. There's very, very little habitation in the archaic period. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, and others, for, I'm not as familiar with the Boeotia surveys or for instance, the ones in the Argolid that were done by the American school, but it seems to be the pattern is basically seems to be kind of the same. Um, there's the number of the, the, the countryside is not, is not filled in. The, the countryside doesn't fill in until the classical period. I'm just wondering if you would kind of comment on this. I think it fits into your picture, even though I'm not exactly sure how. <laughs> Did everybody hear that? Yes. Well, uh, thank you. Yes, uh, of course, this uh, survey evidence is important, uh, truly. But uh, what seems to be crucial in, in this uh, survey evidence, not only in these cases you mentioned, but also, for example, this Laconian survey, uh, very well known, and, and some others, uh, is that that um, uh, it, uh, it uh, usually does not come from the central plains. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, what it does demonstrate is that the marginal uh, areas, uh, the outskirts of the Polish territories were very thinly populated or not populated at all during the, uh, during the uh, earlier archaic period. And then uh, they were occupied uh, so during the late archaic or classical periods. Uh, but what uh, was uh, the situation on the central plains uh, remains usually outside uh, the scope of this service. Uh, and even if the, in these cases, when the service uh, in a way touched the central plains, um, as for example, this Boeotian uh, survey near Thespiae, uh, we, what we can see uh, is uh, that, or what the service can tell us that there was not um, much inhabitation uh, near the um, Polish center or near the center, which means that uh, the people did not live there. But uh, that, uh, the fact that the people did not live there does not necessarily mean that they did not cultivate the lands there. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the po Polish territories were indeed very small. And, and uh, as uh, the picture, my picture of uh, Orchomenos perhaps would demonstrate, uh, there is no need in such a case to live on the landscape. You could very well live in the Polish center and cultivate your lands, which uh, were in the reach of uh, one hour's walk. So uh, we cannot expect uh, clear signs of uh, habitation in these plains. And, and therefore, I cannot see how this uh, evidence can tell us much about the land regime on the plains during the archaic period. That, that would be my comment. No, it, it, it's, um, I'm not exactly sure uh, how it does affect. I mean, there's no question that in certain areas there's much more dense habitation. Um, and, but this also gets into the question of, uh, it's also the question of uh, whether you've got farmers who are, as you say, living um, in the cities and going out to their land. Um, but even in that case, there would be traces if that's happening later. On the other hand, the Victor Hansen idea that basically there are all these kind of Laertes that are kind of uh, on uh, independent farmsteads uh, that are kind of forming the kind of backbone. I don't know if you have any kind of comments on Victor Hansen's kind of views of the way the polis develops. No, first, uh, Hansen still assumes that uh, this uh, there was some sort of uh, of um, uh, increase of this um, number of of, uh, of smallholders during the early archaic period or eighth century, hmm. which I won't not quite agree with. Um, but in principle, uh, well, 
I still cannot say, uh, see how, uh, why should we suppose that this uh, farm as a uh, smallholder should have lived uh, uh, on their plots. Mm -hmm. They very clearly could, uh, could have lived uh, in the center, whatever the center was. Even Hesiod, uh, when we look at this landscape there, uh, there is this Askra, this hill of Askra, and uh, the, the fields are very close by. So uh, there was no need for, for a Hesiod to, to, uh, to live on his plot. He could very easily gone from his village, uh, small town, whatever it was, uh, to, to cultivate its lands. And well, I am not well. I am no archaeologist, of course, and uh, therefore I cannot tell how uh, how many how much tr recognizable traces such um, cultivation of fields um, must uh, leave on the ground. Um, surely they did not uh, drop uh, valuable bases there. But this everyday uh, ceramics, I think I have read that this cannot be easily recognized on the ground, and therefore not easily identified, and, and there, are, there seems to be problems with that. Well, but I am no archaeologist, as I said. Good. I have just one final point. Um, I just was wondering also, where you gonna, we, uh, Christy brought it up, and also Hans brought it up, this question of Thetes. But I'm also wondering, um, just because we recently, David Lewis and I and another author have just published a book on skilled labor in the classical period. And there's obviously also quite a lot of, well, that's the question really is skilled labor in other words people like sculptors people like potters people like smiths who we hear about in uh hesiod now obviously still it's a predominantly agricultural society but on the other hand there are quite a few kind of manufactured goods which are being traded uh, not only in a short distance but also in long distances how do these non-agricultural laborers who are not just who are who are specialists they don't cat it, it fit into this category of thetes who are kind of hired labor for the hoplites. How do they fit into your picture? Well, I think very easily. Uh, I don't uh, think they were I may intervene necessarily. Try to answer shortly these questions as we have still three uh, other. Go ahead, you should go to the others then. Who would like to ask? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, I said I, I think uh, they could have been uh, when they were wealthy enough these skilled laborers, skilled, uh, skilled workers, so then um, I think they participated. Or they could have participated in any case. Well, but, but of course, there could have been exclusions, as Aristotle said, that in some uh, or in many um, places in the archaic times, they were excluded. Here, I cannot say more. I don't know. OK. Uh, uh, actually, we are sacrificing a part of our coffee break through this, but I think it is quite reasonable to do that. Uh, and we have still three questions, if I see correctly. Uh, Yanis Xidopoulos, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, I see that we have David Lewis, uh, Andrei Sankowski, and uh, Marek Vetrovsky still right. would like to... Uh, I, uh, I suppose this is the right uh, series of them. Well, David Lewis, please ask uh, as concisely as possible and uh, might give uh, a very concise answer to that to go on to the next ones. Please. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, I basically agree with you. And um, yeah, you, you, so th thanks very much for your paper. It makes me um, happy and um, I'm going to say similar things and make a, a few different points to back up that kind of picture tomorrow. Um, just about the elites in Homer, um, they quite obviously have an obligation to the demos. So in, in terms of ideology, even though Homer, uh, the Homeric epics reflect a kind of elite viewpoint in certain respects, um, that viewpoint still accommodates the idea that these elites can misbehave and that there's a there's an ideal of behavior that involves protecting the demos and they have obligations to provide straight justice and to um, protect the community in times of danger and not to endanger it by, for example, like Antinous's dad, um, raiding a neighboring community that will um, result in counter raids um, falling on the demos itself. Um, you also see this in, in the Iliad in Book 12 with um, Sarpedon talking to Glaucos, where he says, you know, why, why do people um, give us the most honor in the community? Well, it's because we, we fight in the forefront of battle for um, 
um, for, our, for that community. So there's a sense of kind of noblesse oblige um, right from the outset. And, and therefore in, in the Solonian situation, it's um, elites not performing this, that they are exploiting the, the, the demos. And this is a, not an example of traditional aristocratic dominance, but actually an aberration of the um, ideal order and relation between the um, demos and its leaders. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave that, that point there and thank you very much. Okay, please, might give a short answer. Well, uh, I perhaps missed the question. Uh, well, of course, uh, sure, uh, the elite, well, in such a society uh, where, uh, the, the, let's say, common people count, uh, then uh, in such a society, elite, of course, always must justify its position. Otherwise, it, it cannot lead, simply. The people would not have obeyed. So, uh, so quite clearly, uh, they had to show that we are we are necessary for the people. We are not exploiters, indeed, by no means. Uh, but, but we are in behalf of you. And uh, well, uh, I think it it is a, some sort of sign of the egalitarianism of this society. The the elite always needs to justify its power. The elite cannot take its power as as something grand. Yeah, that's okay, thanks. Uh, Andre and Mark, yes. uh, please state also uh, okay. concise way your uh, questions. Okay. I will be very short. Uh, is there no, is there some confusion between the use of the word democracy and the participating of the demos in the some kind of decision making? If we compare of course, we can use the word democracy in a very large way, as we do today. But if we comply with ancient sources, uh, Aristoteles or the Athenian understanding of this word, democracy is something very specific. I mean, it is based on the equality of the people, of all citizens, not only on the participation, participating of citizens in the decision making. and. If you look at the Athenian institutions, the, the Athenian democracy is something very specific in this uh, uh, sense, and there is a, uh, a very precise institutional organization based uh, namely on this collaboration between the boule and the assembly. And this is the model which will be reproduced then during the Hellenistic period and is, will be considered as a the democracy, in fact, the, the, the on, almost the only one model uh, considered as uh, the good one. So maybe there's uh, a, a kind of, uh, I would say, abusive use, usage of this word democracy in modern works. Uh, uh, when we look at the participation of people, common people in the decision making. Thank you, Andre. I would propose that Marek uh, uh, and uh, questions also the point the point uh, he wishes and might would give an answer to both uh, questions. Okay, Mark Vitovsky, please uh, take your question. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So it's not a question, just a brief comment. Uh, uh, I fully agree, or almost with your argument and just add another uh, to uh, the importance of the common people uh, in the convention used by the Homeric poems. If we rely on the descriptions of the assemblies, these are either decided by the demos, so to say, or the people, or undecided. So there is no decision. Uh, we just do not see uh, uh, the cases in which elite, whatever that would be, uh, has an influence, even in this conventional picture of the Homeric world, which is conventional. Uh, but the assemblies are not uh, uh, subdued to the will uh, of, of, the, uh, of the leaders. And this is something very important in this conventional uh, picture. Thank you. Well, thank you. I, I of course, completely agree with, uh, with Marek. Uh, but as uh, for the democracy, uh, so I, uh, I think, uh, at least I try to avoid uh, this word democracy uh, or yeah, democracy in the strict sense uh, 
and I truly agree with that uh, quite clearly. That what was democracy in the classical period, uh, or what we know as democracy mainly from Athens, uh, is a very specific uh, specific way of uh, government. And I do not think, of course, by no means do I think that this uh, specific form of government did exist in any archaic police. And I pointed out in the end, I think very clearly that I think that this um, these democracies, classical democracies, are clearly such institutionalized statements of uh, the people's power beyond what was tradition. <laughs> yeah, that's. Thanks for your answer. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, concluded the discussion uh, of the first paper. And it is very nice that there was a fruitful uh, reaction, a rich and fruitful reaction uh, to your views. Uh, uh, to follow as closely as possible uh, the pattern of our program, uh, we have uh, now uh, 12 minutes uh, until the beginning of uh, Van Vee's paper, uh, which we could use uh, for the coffee break. Uh, well, we shall be again on our screens after uh, 12 minutes uh, to listen to Hans uh, van Wees. Okay? Uh, Hans, if you are listening, uh, yep. yes, uh, let's have the break. If you're listening, do you have a presentation? I, I have uh, PowerPoint slides. Can I just uh, try sharing? And see yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, da -da -da. If I may also briefly intervene. Yes. Um, uh, there will be a Padlet. Uh, if you if you want to ask questions, the speaker, or if you want to exchange views so with someone, if you or if you want to ask a general question, everybody, and um, I will pass on an address uh, to you so that during coffee breaks you could uh, talk to people um, uh, in in a way. We we just are working out for this. A uh, way in order to offset uh, the absence of discussions in the coffee breaks and during the lunch breaks. Uh, so I will pass it on to you right away. I will pass on to you the address um, and um, you will be able to use it. It's very easy to use. It's like a it's like a board of cork where you put up your paper and you ask your question and people can comment um, uh, below. Um, I thank uh, Diane Harris Klein, who actually had us uh, send it uh, to us uh, and uh, um, suggested this uh, for this conference. Katerina, Katerina, when you send the link, make sure to include attendees as well, because otherwise only the panelists uh, see the link. Uh, <laughs> you mean in the chat? Because yes. I will pass it on in the chat. Okay. Yes, will... it gives you an option to include both panelists and attendees. So include both so that our attendees can see it as well. Okay. All right. We okay. Sorry. Sorry. Can I? Sorry. Can I just ask this check? Um, so I've put. Uh, um, hopefully, I'm sharing my um, power yes. slide. What, can I just check one thing? If I go to if I go to presenter mode, whether you still get the normal uh, slideshow. So I'll, I'll change now. Um, is your picture still the same, or do you now see my presenter mode screen? The same. The same for you? Okay. So, uh, right. Okay. And if I do this, you've got just... Yes. 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 Brilliant. Okay. okay, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. Is, is there some some coffee online? or? This... <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear. <laughs> this is not produced. <laughs> virtual coffee and i say because this conference is hosted in crete there can only be virtual rakis no coffee for the conference uh, participants so uh, the drink of the land is raki i'm sorry yes we'll have a virtual raki later on Arthur. eva costa yes as a cool applaus is an Ακολουθώ το πρόγραμμα όσο πιο πιστά μπορώ. Ελπίζω Μια να μην... χαρά, πάρα πολύ καλά. Καθόλου, καθόλου, πάρα πολύ καλά. 
μπορεί να παρεμβεί και να μου δώσει κάτι. Α πούμε, προσπάθησα. Τέλεια, λοιπόν, και όλε τι ερωτήσει τι κάναμε και ένα τέταρτο αφήσαμε για yeah, έτσι, έτσι, χαλάρωση. Τέλεια, νομίζω. Στο break είπα να, να φάω ένα κομμάτι για να διχολυνθούν όλοι να εκφράσουν τι απόψει του. Καλά κάνατε. Από τη στιγμή που ο καθένα μπορεί να σκοθεί και να πάει μέχρι την καφετιέρα του. Ε, ε, ναι, νομίζω... υπάρχει, έτσι νομίζω. Και το ίδιο σκοπέω να κάνω και, για το... και μετά τις 2 και 4, αν υπάρχουν ερωτήσεις και μετά τις 2 και 4 θα το παρατείνω λίγο γιατί και το lunch break θα είναι να πάνε όλοι στην κουζίνα τους να φάνε να τόσο. Ακριβώς. Ναι. Ακριβώς. Ε, οτιδήποτε άλλο πείτε το μου. Νομίζω καλά πάμε ως εδώ. Είδα το Τζον Ντέιβις, μήπως ήθελε και ο ίδιος κάτι να πει ως προς αυτά τα οποία λέγονται, πούμε, αλλά δεν, δεν είδα το όνομά του του ερωτών. Θα το, θα το ξαναεξηγήσουμε, μόλις ξαναρχίσουμε, τι ακριβώς πρέπει να κάνουν, γιατί ρωτάνε και οι ατεντείς πώς Αχα. μπορούν να συμμετέχουν στη συζήτηση. Κατερίνα, ο σύνδεσμος yeah. που έστειλε δεν δουλεύει. Δεν δουλεύει. Εγώ το πάτσα και μου βγάζει «The page you are looking for doesn't exist». Ε, πάση, έτσι, αν έχουμε και άλλους ερωτώντες που εγώ για κάποιο λόγο δεν τους βλέπω εγώ κοίταξα μόνο σε αυτό το chat τι λέει παράκληση πείτε τα στον Γιάννη Τζοκουλόπουλο και ο Γιάννης μπορεί Φαντώ. να παρεμβεί και να προσθέσει δεν υπάρχει θέμα, εντάξει Τώρα που θα ξαναρχίσουμε θα ξαναπώ τι πρέπει να κάνουν όλοι προκειμένου να μπορούν να σηκώσουν το χεράκι Έχω και να... ερωτήσεις okay. Φωστά, okay. Το link που έστειλε η Κατερίνα σε μένα δουλεύει Α. Πώς γίνεται. Ε, Κώστα και ένα άλλο, Βλασόπουλε. Ε, ο Άντι Μέντος μου έστειλε μήνυμα ότι δεν, έχει, δεν του έχει έρθει link. Ε, δεν, να δούμε μήπως είναι και κάποιος άλλος που δεν έχει από τους ομιλητές. Θα το τσεκάρω εγώ τώρα. Link. Δεν του έχει έρθει link. Ναι, και το, το ενημέρωσε εγώ τον Άρη. Αλλά να δούμε μήπως είναι και κανένας άλλος που δεν έχει λάβει. Νομίζω και ότι είναι. εδώ είναι. Να σου πω κάτι. Συγγνώμη, ε, εσύ Κρίστη το πατάς αυτό και σου δουλεύει. Ναι, χρησιμοποιώ, να σου πω κάτι, χρησιμοποιώ Chrome. Κι εγώ Chrome χρησιμοποιώ. Α, μπορεί να φταίει η τελεία, μισό λεπτό. Κώστα, δεν είναι θέμα Chrome. Κώστα, έχει μια τελεία. Ναι, την έβγαλα. Εντάξει, την έβγαλα τώρα δουλεύει. Βγάλα την τελεία, μισό λεπτό. Ναι, Κατερίνα, ίσως είναι καλύτερα να βγάλεις την τελεία και από το μήνυμα, για να το καταλάβουν και οι... Μπορώ να κάνω edit στο μήνυμα. Αν το ξαναστείλεις χωρίς την τελεία... Ναι, ναι, ναι. Αυτό το θα το ξαναστείλω. Σας αφήνω για λίγο εγώ γιατί έχω έναν υδραυλικό που έχω διαρροή ταυτόχρονα με το συνέδριο. <laughs> Πασχάλη μου, καλά θα κάνεις. Θα σε σκοτώσει η ευτυχία και δεν θέλω. <laughs> Κατερίνα, μια ερώτηση. Εγώ πώς μπορώ να βγω από το, από, την, από το screen αυτή τη στιγμή και να επανέλθω μετά. Τι θα πατήσω, παιδάκι μου. Ε, Έλετε να κλείσετε την κάμερα. Screen. Για να κλείσετε την κάμερα ή για να, βγάλετε, να, βγείτε, να βλέπετε για όλο... Για να πω λίγο και να ξαναμπώ μετά. Τι, τι πρέπει ε, να πατήσω. Κάτω αριστερά θα ναι. δείτε το stop video. Το, το, το έχω πατήσει. Όχι, όχι κ, κ, κύριε Βραζέλη. Εάν ναι. βάλτε το ποντίκι πάνω στην οθόνη, ναι. θα δείτε ε, κάτω, ε, περίπου στο κέντρο της οθόνης σας, έχει ένα κόκκινο κουμπάκι που λέει «Leave». Α, ε. Αυτό όμως θα σας βγάλει τελείως. Ναι, αυτό... μισό λεπτό. Πριν βγείτε, πριν βγείτε, κάντε εμένα πάλι host, γιατί θα έχουμε πρόβλημα. Οκ, okay, οκ. Okay. Γιατί αν δεν πάνω στο όνομά μου. Μένει πάνω στο όνομά κυβέρνητο. Στο... Κατάλαβα, κατάλαβα. Οκ, οκ. Περιμεστάσω να το βρω αυτό. Λοιπόν, εκεί που λέει more, έτσι. Ναι. Λοιπόν, more μου βγάζει stop live stream. Αυτό απατήσω. Όταν πατάω το more, μου βγάζει μόνο το stop live stream. Ωραία. Εμένα, το δικό μου το όνομα το βλέπετε. Το δικό σου όνομα το βλέπω στην εικόνα σου. Όχι στην εικόνα μου, στη λίστα με τους participants. Στην άκρη, άκρη δεξιά. 
Αχ, Θεέ μου. Ε, λίστα με παρ... Ναι, ωραία, το βρήκα. Ωραία. Να πάρω το όνομά σου από τη λίστα με τους participants και εκεί να πατήσω Make Vlasopoulos Host. Θα πατήσετε πρώτα το More, θα σας βγάλει μια λίστα με επιλογές και θα επιλέξετε εκεί πέρα το Make, make Him Host, λέει τέλος πάντων. Θα σου να δω, ρε, Κώστα. Ε, έβγαλα τη λίστα με τους participants. Κάτσε. Βάλτε το βελάκι πάνω στο όνομά μου. Πέρι, 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 πέρι. Λοιπόν, ωραία. Λοιπόν, και σε κάνω host. Εντάξει ή όχι. Ε, μισό λεπτάκι. Πρέπει να σας έβγαλε τώρα ένα ε, παραθυράκι επιβεβαίωσης. Αχ, θέμα, πού είναι αυτό το παραθυράκι. Θα σας πέταξε ένα, ένα παράθυρο στην οθόνη, αν το κάνατε σωστά, που λέει να τον κάνω όντω και πατάτε ναι. Εγώ δεν το βλέπω αυτό το παραθυράκι. Κάτσε, θα το ξανακάνω. Ξανακάτε. Περίμενε, περίμενε. Λασόπουλος. Αν μπορώ να επέμβω και πάλι, αρκεί το stop video και το mute για να λείψει για λίγο. Ε, το, το stop Ωραία. video το έχω πατήσει και το mute. Ωραία, η οθόνη σας είναι κλειστή, κύριε Μπουραζέλ, βλέπουμε αυτή τη στιγμή. Ναι, το... Αν πατήσετε και το mute, δεν θα σας ακούμε επίσης. Ωραία, τώρα ούτε σας ακούμε, ούτε σας βλέπουμε. Ωραία, οπότε μπορείτε να φύγετε και να, να μην πειράξετε κάτι. Ευχαριστούμε, Πασχάλη. Κώστα, να σε ρωτήσω κάτι. Κώστα. Ναι, α, sorry. Έλα, Έλα να σου ακούς. Όταν κάνουν, οι, όταν κάνουν share screen οι άλλοι, έτσι, ε, για να το καταλάβω, ουσιαστικά παγιδεύουν και την οθόνη μας. Δεν μπορούμε δηλαδή να βλέπουμε, ας πούμε, για παράδειγμα, το, το handout ταυτόχρονα ή όχι, αν δεν το έχουμε τυπώσει. Ε, Κατάλαβε ε, το ε. Καλή ερώτηση. Γιατί δεν... εγώ δοκίμασα να το κάνω και δεν μπορούσα όταν γίνεται share screen. Δεν κάνεις... μπορούσα να δω ταυτόχρονα και χάντα ο Πασχάλης θα ξέρει καλύτερα αυτά ίσως γίνεται. Βρε, νομίζω, νομίζω ότι αυτό που μπορείς να κάνεις είναι να μειώσεις... Ε, ναι, πώς το λένε, να μην είναι... Ε, αν κοιτάξει yeah. πάνω πάνω... Να κάνω έξι screen μειώσεις, αυτό. Να μειώσει το παράθυρο, να το κάνει να πιάνει τη μισή οθόνη και στο άλλο μισό να έχει το, το yeah. hand out. Εντάξει, οκ. Ναι, σου ευχαριστώ. Ε, Γιάννη, θες να πάρεις εσύ τα ενία να ξεκινήσουμε σιγά σιγά. Yeah. Απλά να πω πριν ξεκινήσουμε, να πω τι να κάνουν για να, να παίρνουν το λόγο. Αλλά... Ναι, εγώ πριν κάποια λεπτά είδα το PowerPoint of Hans Vez. Ε, τώρα δεν το, δεν το βλέπω. Θα το, θα το ρυθμίσουμε. Ah, okay, yes. uh, just briefly, uh, before we start again, just, I, I will just say again, uh, both for panelists and for attendees, what you need to do if you want to participate in the discussion. Uh, if you put your uh, cursor on the screen, you will see down on your uh, screen, There are a number of options, mute, stop video, and participants. If you click that button on the right side of your screen, the list of participants will appear. And at the end of the names in the list of the participants, you will see an option which says raise hand. You click that, you raise your hand, and the, uh, the chairs know that you want to ask a question. That works both for panelists and for attendees. But attendees will need to wait until the chairs give, uh, click a button and allow them uh, to speak. So that way uh, we can uh, organize the discussion better. So please click that button to raise your hand. And remember, once you have asked your question or made your comment, to, to lower down your hand so that only those remaining are still in the list. Uh, that's all from me. Uh, back to Yanis uh, for the session. So welcome back. I do hope that you had some coffee or whatever. Our next speaker uh, needs no special uh, introduction since Professor Hanves is uh, a well-known author. And uh, he will be talking today on uh, what else? Military change. Uh, and uh, we are looking forward to his uh, stimulating, I hope, and I believe uh, presentation. So Professor Hanves. You may begin. 
Thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everyone, the, the organizers, of course, for giving me this, this opportunity to um, express my admiration for John's uh, work in this, in this way, uh, and also to be part of this really exciting and ambitious uh, conference. I've uh, enjoyed it so far, and I'm sure I'll enjoy the rest uh, uh, equally much. Um, I'll go back to try and uh, share my screen. Um, seems fine first, but during the break, I was having some trouble. So let's see uh, how it goes. Um, okay, um, this is the problem. I, I cannot get the slideshow back on by, for some reason. Um, oh, okay, maybe it did work this time. Uh, apologies. Okay, so um, yes, my topic um, uh, is change in warfare. Um, and uh, I guess rather like might, I, I, I feel that um, the, the main problems in identifying uh, long-term historical change in my topic, but also the main opportunities for saying something new and hopefully interesting uh, are by revisiting the, uh, the archaic period uh, above all. Um, and I can take my cue there for, uh, from you know, one, of, one of John's, well, uh, countless contributions to scholarship, a relatively recent uh, paper uh, that you see in the left-hand column there uh, on the, the pre-history of the uh, Athenian Empire, uh, which John has um, unearthed. Um, uh, I note in the, in the other column um, that this idea of, of an earlier an Athenian Empire before the Athenian Empire has been picked up, um, and um, a very recent paper uh, even uh, coins the, the phrase of the first Athenian Empire uh, for it. So. Um, we start uh, from that um, and broaden out from that into the, the history of Greek warfare more broadly. Um, John's argument about, uh, about Athens there is that um, uh, well before the Delian League, etc., uh, Athens engages in uh, opportunistic expansion from about 550 uh, onwards and then um, the rapid creation of a substantial proto-empire uh, from about 5, 510. Um, so the, the implications for the history of Greek warfare are uh, potentially uh, important, I think. Um, if the beginning of naval empire then coinc coincides with uh, what I suppose is regarded as the epitome of, of traditional hope light warfare, the Battle of Champions, um, uh, what does that mean for our, our picture of the, the broader developments in warfare, uh, specifically were short local rule-bound conflicts fought by hope lights over small areas of border territory Kind of the definition almost of hope like warfare, were these actually any more typical of archaic warfare than uh, overseas uh, expansion of the type that we see from Athens uh, was? So that's my answer. Uh, no. uh, and you'll probably want me to elaborate a bit on that. So um, here's an outline of what I uh, want to say in, in what follows. Um, uh, so first of all, that actually predatory and expansionist forms of warfare were the norm uh, from, well, I'd like to say from the beginning, this is almost from as soon as we have any uh, evidence to work with. Um, that, and this is where I will start in a moment, that multiple uh, naval and land empires of sorts uh, based on direct occupation of territory were established already um, uh, around seven, uh, sorry, around 600 BC. Um, and, and finally, um, this will be my main point about structural change, uh, and sadly in, in pretty much direct contradiction with uh, Might's argument from a moment ago, um, that there is a structural social economic change from the middle, uh, middle of the sixth century uh, onwards, which then gives rise to this uh, hope like uh, middle class, which changes the nature of land-based warfare and uh, creates the possibility um, of hegemonic uh, warfare, which is a, a new thing. Um, so, the problem with making this case um, uh, is, of course, um, as I hinted earlier, that the archaic evidence is, uh, is uh, problematic in all sorts of ways. Um, scholarship has tended to fluctuate, I suppose, between um, maybe um, in the old days, you know, ac accept all of it uncritically, uh, and, and to more recently, perhaps, uh, going to the other extreme and believing none of it, and just, you know, basically starting Greek history in the fifth century. Um, uh, what I want to do is begin with a sort of case study, if you like, um, in some detail to show you how I propose to use um, th the evidence that we have, and then uh, broaden it out from, from there. Now, the, the case study is the, um, 
the episode of the Athenian uh, seizure of Sigeon uh, around about 600 BC, the so Eusebian date is 607, but well, can't take that as uh, gospel clearly. Um, one of the questions that's uh, often asked is whether this is um, a short-lived private venture, which I guess would fit better with traditional ideas about the development of Greek warfare, um, or um, a kind of an attempt at an early empire, uh, which would extend John's case for you know, the, the prehistory of the Athenian empire even further back. Um, the advantage we have here, uh, one advantage we have here is that we do at least know that it, pretty sure that it really happened uh, because we have these fragments of Archaeus, you know, contemporary poetry um, that refer to this episode. Um, Archaeus fragment uh, 167 mentions Phrynon, the name of the uh, Athenian commander uh, in, a, in a sort of military naval context uh, and famously fragment uh, 428, um, he uh, speaks of losing his shield uh, to the, the Attics, uh, to the Athenians. So there are Athenians fighting there somewhere uh, in his uh, ambit. Um, and uh, Phrynon is mentioned as the, their commander. So uh, that's relatively well established. Um, now, key argument, I suppose, for this being just a, a short-lived private venture is the very latest evidence. Um, you see there, Polyinus, uh, Diogenes Laertius, uh, who mentioned this duel between uh, uh, Pittacus and, and Phrynon, Pittacus of Mytilene, um, and, and the Athenian commander Phrynon. Um, for a start, it's a duel that already sounds like a dubiously um, historical sort of tale. Uh, and secondly, they then say that this duel was the decisive factor in the war, that uh, because Phrynon was killed, um, the uh, Mytilenians and the Pittacus took back Sigeon or according to Diogenes, um, Achilleon, um, the, um, sorry, I think I have a uh, laser pointer uh, option here. <laughs> so yeah, uh, can you see my laser pointer if I do this? You see a red dot on the screen? Yes, we can see it. Yes. Excellent, okay. So um, Sigeon here and then Achilleon uh, here, these are the two places that we are uh, talking about. <clears throat> Um, so that's the latest evidence, and that would fit, you know, a traditional perception of the development of uh, Greek warfare quite well. However, if we go back uh, in time a bit, um, we get some Hellenistic uh, authors who do mention the duel, but um, state quite clearly that it didn't uh, end the conflict, um, which was actually ended by an arbitration by Periander of Corinth uh, in favor of the Athenians. And if you go back a bit further still, um, the classical evidence, Herodotus, uh, in fact, uh, doesn't mention the duel at all, but does mention the arbitration and that it favored Athens um, and adds that there was um, subsequently or at some, for, for some length of time, a war between Sigeon and Achilleon, uh, and that at some point by Sistratus uh, recaptured Sigeon by force. And this is part of uh, John's story of the um, uh, sort of mid sixth century. Um, expansion. Uh, if we turn to the archaeology, we've got some. Um, Sigeon has been uh, excavated on off rather uh, by uh, most recently by Thomas Schaefer, most recently to my knowledge by Thomas Schaefer of uh, Tübingen. Um, that sort of helps in that um, the pottery finds show that Sigeon was uh, occupied in the seventh century already. Um, and continue to be occupied for uh, several centuries thereafter. Um, the assemblage of pottery, there's greyware, which um, used to be called the Odian greyware, and so that could well come from, from Lesbos and Mytilene, but could come from elsewhere. And there's Corinthian um, and Attic, which is inevitable. So there's no stratification. It doesn't really tell us whether the site was abandoned or who was in control, but it, um, it fits broadly. More. Um, helpfully for my purposes, is um, the excavation of um, Achilleon, which was done by uh, Manfred Kaufmann of uh, Troy fame, and helpfully summarized actually by uh, an Irene uh, Ellis Evans uh, recently, um, the references are on the screen, um, uh, which um, has shown that Achilleon was occupied quite briefly, uh, 580 to 535, 
maybe uh, excessively precise dates, but that's what the what Kaufman concluded. Um, it's fortified. It has these polygonal masonry walls that you associate with um, um, lesbian fortifications, and it, it is a very small site, 80 by 40 meters. And um, Ellis Evans, um, to my mind, uh, compellingly argues that this is really a small fort. It's not uh, a polis. It's not an independent city. It's a it's a fort, a fortified base. Now, if, if that is right, um, and the period of occupation is right, then I think that must imply um, that Segeon continued to pose a threat um, uh, be between 580 and 535, uh, i.e. that it, it broadly remained in Athenian hands. It wasn't just abandoned or taken back, taken back by uh, Mytilene. Um, otherwise, that fort would have served uh, little purpose. So if Herodotus is right that Pisistratus uh, had to fight to get it back, uh, that may well imply a, a quite short, uh, a brief interlude where the the, for, uh, the Sigeon was lost um, to Athens um, before it was taken back by, uh, by Pisistratus. So well, you know, one could imagine, this is pure speculation, but one could imagine that once uh, Mytilene was in business with the Persian Empire after for uh, uh, 550, sorry, 545, um, and, and Herodotus tells some stories suggesting that Mytilenians were quite um, keen to engage with the Persian uh, imperial project, um, that they then had an opportunity to take back uh, Sigeon, but that Pisistratus uh, struck back quite quickly and presumably reached an accommodation of his own with, uh, with the Persians. So um, that would be an argument for saying it was not a short-lived venture. It was actually, uh, you know, after the initial seizure by, Ath by Athenians, it remained in Athenian hands for, well, uh, for the rest of the sixth century and thereafter. Um, second point, um, the second point about, you know, how likely is it to have been just a private uh, venture, shall we say, a sort of small pirate or adventurous band that took this place. Um, I, I suppose that already becomes less likely if they um, hang on to it uh, for uh, the rest of um, the sixth century. Um, but I would stress even more that uh, this is unlikely because of the nature of the enemy here. I mentioned Michelini several times already. Um, uh, this is not like many new settlements or colonies or whatever you want to call them, um, are, you know, settled in a place where there isn't previously a city. Um, the sources seem quite clear in the archaeology with, you know, seventh century uh, Aeolian pottery uh, confirms that this is already an existing town. Um, Herodotus, who gives the Athenian version of the story, um, says that the, the Mycenaeans demanded the place back. So, you know, they had it before. Um, there's more, uh, uh, there's a tradition about the um, Mycenaeans building the walls of Sigeon uh, by um, plundering stones from Troy and so forth. So what the Athenians, whoever they were, did uh, was actually take away an existing town from the control of, of uh, a fellow uh, Greek uh, state. Um, uh, and that raises questions as to how they were able to do that, uh, especially since Mytilene appears to have been extremely uh, powerful. Um, there's Strabo's comment that already at this time, the lesbians uh, laid claim to almost the whole Troad, where most of the settlements were their foundations. Um, and um, if you look at the, the map uh, next to that from uh, Ellis Evans, uh, we know, of course, from Thucydides and uh, ATL that by 427, um, Mytilene controlled um, pretty much the whole coast of the Troad. Let me get my pointer again from Antandros uh, all along here to Ophrynaeon, uh, the Actaean cities. Uh, control these uh, to the extent that Athens, by defeating Mytilene, automatically gained, i.e. without further fighting, gained control of all these cities which then appear in the in the tribute lists. Um, so certainly by 427 the Athenians had, uh, sorry, the Mytileneans had great control over this whole region. Um, uh, Ellis Evans uh, argues uh, very interestingly that the, the lack of um, coining, of minting, um, before 427 in this area, and also the general lack of, of urbanization reflects uh, the direct exploitation by Mytilene of this territory. I, these are not just dependent cities, but they're really, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, directly controlled territory uh, on his view. Um, so you know, whether this is uh, already the case you know, around 600, as opposed to 
27, uh, we can't strictly prove, but I would argue that this um, episode of uh, Mytilenean intervention all the way up here, you know, so quite far from home, at more or less at the far end of that territory, um, by the first instance, Pithecus and uh, Archaeus, you know, really the, the elite of their town to defend, uh, to, to regain this place, and subsequently to then build a fort, which they maintained for, you know, 50 odd years in order to try and keep it back or at least keep it under control, does already suggest 600 BC, a very active interest uh, involvement in this area. Uh, and therefore, you know, um, something of um, a naval empire um, for Mytilene. Um, and it's not even confined to the Troad, to the, uh, to the Actaean cities. Um, Mytilene is also said to have founded, uh, given the details there, um, Iris Bay in, in the Troad, uh, which is not on the map, but uh, is about here. Um, Sestos and Maditos are attributed to the lesbians, and the Mytileneans are the likely candidates. Uh, Alopeconesos are approximately here. Um, Aeolians, it may be them or it may be others. And then Ainos in Thrace, which is sort of off the, <laughs> off the, the map. Uh, around about here, um, again founded by Aeolians, but later said to have taken Mycelinian settlers um, as well. Um, so that's quite, um, quite an empire, I would say, uh, for Mycelini. Uh, again, we have a bit of archaeology um, quite recently, uh, very carefully excavated uh, Maditos uh, and found um, uh, Aslan and Sachi there, uh, found, uh, again, occupation, uh, from about um, yeah, 750 onwards, um, oval and upsidal buildings, uh, grey ware, uh, G2 slash 3 ware, um, the whole assemblage that uh, one finds quite widely in the north, um, northern Aegean, um, but uh, also at Lesbos, and so certainly compatible with the idea that there are settlers from Lesbos, perhaps even specifically Mytilene, um, arriving there in the mid 8th century. Um, and then from about 650 onwards, uh, a change in the pottery assemblage uh, to include various imported pottery, um, Ionian uh, and Ionian bird balls uh, specifically, um, which would be compatible with the idea that um, as the Black Sea trade begins to open up, these uh, Ionian slash Mycelinian uh, settlements are beginning to uh, take an active part, uh, form an active part of these trade networks giving a, certainly a further incentive for Mytilene to uh, get uh, or stay uh, more actively involved. Um, so I mean, if, if we accept that and therefore that Mytilene had a very substantial naval empire by about 600 BC, uh, as I say, it becomes quite unlikely that a handful of Athenian adventurers would seize a, um, a, a town from, from their hands and hold on to it for a century, uh, and much more likely that this would have had to be a, a public um, Athenian, a collective Athenian uh, enterprise that continued to be supported by Athens uh, for, through the sixth century. Um, further point to uh, reinforce that uh, is the, uh, the role of the arbitrator of, uh, of Corinth, of Periander of Corinth. Um, again, one could be maybe skeptical uh, and say, you know, so later fiction, um, I would object partly that it's uh, perhaps unlikely that the Athenians uh, or indeed the Mycenaeans would be appealing to Periander, who by the classical period is a notorious uh, villain uh, as, their, uh, as their, their judge. Uh, but more importantly, perhaps there is this uh, striking reference in Aristotle's rhetoric to um, a recent, he says, uh, episode in which Tenedos appealed to, um, in, a, in a territorial dispute of their own, um, appealed to Periander of Corinth's uh, uh, judgment against, uh, against, well, they appealed against the Sigeians to Periander of Corinth's earlier judgment. This has got to be a reference to this um, uh, business at Sigeon. Um, there's nothing in Herodotus's account of that, that the Sigeians, that Tenadians rather could have used. To, Herodotus just says each side was to keep the territory it had. Um, uh, if Tenedos was able to appeal in some way to this judgment, they, they at least must have thought they had a, a fuller version of it, which was a bit more specific about what Periander uh, decided. Um, the Herodotus account 
uh, mentions the Athenian, explains the Athenian case, the, the claim that they made to uh, to Sigeon, uh, which very much sounds like the kind of um, claim that um, Greek cities make in, in later attested uh, arbitrations. And so all of this really adds up to a view that there was at least a fuller tradition. Um, an optimist might even think maybe even a, rich, maybe even a, a record uh, of this arbitration that people were later uh, able to refer to. Um, it's not surprising, I mean, if, and if, if this is true, it's not surprising that uh, Periander and Corinth were, were chosen. Uh, Corinth too, uh, by 600, has a sort of naval uh, empire. Um, Thucydides uh, credits them with being the first city in Greece to build triremes, create a modern navy, suppress sea raiders and pirates. Um, there's a tradition of, of, of settlement in Ambrachia, Electorion and Lucas. Uh, under Kipsilus, uh, governed by his own sons, i.e. Uh, not independent settlements, but uh, under um, Corinthian control. And then the tradition about Periander himself um, from, uh, well, this is from uh, uh, Nicolaus of Damascus, essentially uh, Ephorus, it's safe to say. Uh, he campaigned constantly, it was warlike, built triremes, controlled both seas, uh, the tradition that he subjected Corsaira, you know, previously a uh, Corinthian foundation, but previously evidently not dependent, but uh, brought under subjection by Periander, uh, captured Epidauros, um, colonized Potidaea, which remained uh, famously under direct uh, Corinthian control, uh, maintained diplomatic relations with Trasibulus of Miletus, um, uh, with Aliatus of Lydia. Um, this is clearly um, a, a, a figure and a, and a city which does play an enormously uh, influential international role and is very expansionist and uh, has at this point a, um, uh, an empire of its own. And so the, the, the key point about this is to say that if we can accept that both Mytilene and Corinth uh, by 600 BC had really substantial um, maritime uh, empires and uh, fleets to, uh, to support these, um, there is no obvious reason why Athens couldn't at least have had the same ambition uh, at this point uh, and try to get in on the act by settling uh, at Sigeon, where the final question, this is a very extended case study and we'll, uh, we'll uh, speed up uh, shortly, but the very uh, final point about Sigeon, you know, why, why this place? Um, it's, um, you see from the aerial view, may, may look as if it's got uh, nice uh, agricultural plains adjoining, um, but um, bearing in mind where the, um, the ancient um, sea level was, Actually, Sigeon is definitely not a place you want to settle if you want agricultural uh, land. Let me get up the uh, laser pointer again, right there. They are here, uh, essentially at the bottom of a spit of land. There is not a big plain there um, for them to cultivate. So conceivably, they could have set themselves up as a sort of pirate's nest, but it's hard to see what, um, what good it would do Periander to uh, tolerate that. Uh, and again, I would say it's much more likely that they settle there because it is a, a key point on naval routes, um, the ships wanting to pass into the, the Hellespont uh, and, and into the Black Sea uh, may con conveniently wait here for the right sort of winds, as people have often pointed out. Um, and that surely is what Athens mainly wanted to get out of this, um, a degree of um, uh, a, a position in which they can profit from uh, perhaps even control a degree of trade into the Black Sea. And given that the Black Sea is really only opened up by uh, Miletus um, uh, in the middle of the seventh century, uh, probably Miletus and other Ionians, uh, middle of the seventh century, um, one could argue that um, by Athens by uh, occupying Sigeon um, is seizing the first possible opportunity to get in, to muscle in, you might say, on this, on this activity. Um, the Black Sea trade is only just um, not going. Um, and uh, this is a time when both Miletus uh, and Mytilene are uh, otherwise occupied, Miletus with uh, a war against Lydia, uh, and um, uh, Mytilene with its uh, protracted civil war that Archaeus tells us all about. So I would see one can easily see this as the Athenians um, making a start on creating a naval empire of their own and competing with uh, at least two naval empires that already existed um, um, around 600 BC. Um, as I said, so this was my very extended case study to see, um, to show you um, how I um, 
piece together the story from different bits of evidence. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go much quicker through the rest just to, to show you that there is a bit more material, but I, I can't illustrate this in equal detail, obviously. Um, so there are other uh, literary traditions about hinting at early naval empires who are same in expedition into the Propontis, um, uh, a key and fleet helping to defend Miletus and so forth and so forth. Um, the, um, the war between Colchis and Eritrea, um, usually known as the Lilantine War, supported by Samos and Miletus, fits well in this sort of context uh, much better than in the earlier context of um, uh, uh, Hesiod and, uh, and Archilochus uh, fighting off, uh, over the, the plain. Um, and I suggest that maybe um, a sixth century war along these lines is uh, a possibility. It would mean that Polycrates of Samos is not really the first um, th Thalassocrat that uh, Herodotus makes him, um, uh, although his empire is perhaps rather different from some of the earlier ones. Um, and one can make some sense of some of the stories relating to Polycrates in the light of this, this background, um, the fact that according to Herodotus, a Mytilenean general naval levy is actually not something you hear about very often, a general naval levy uh, defended Miletus against an attack by Polycrates and the expedition 525 uh, against Samos, which is presented by Herodotus as essentially a Spartan expedition with keen, his word, uh, participation of the Corinthians, one could quite easily see that as perhaps something uh, driven by Corinth as one of the established naval powers uh, keen to um, uh, prevent um, an, an upstart from uh, taking over too much of their domain. So that's um, naval empires. Um, I would argue as well, um, again, um, briefly if I can, um, that land-based empires also exist relatively uh, early, despite the famous quote from Thucydides uh, on the left, which I, uh, I won't read out, uh, you know, to the effect that there were no, uh, there were no land-based campaigns for empire or for, for expansion, it was just neighbors fighting one another. Um, obviously the conquest of Messenia uh, would be the, the big exception and one could always argue um, that Sparta is uh, completely exceptional in this way, um, but it is certainly a big exception that Thucydides uh, over, overlooks, ignores. Um, I would stress as well that according to the tradition, um, late literary tradition, um, but to an extent supported by Tertius, um, these war, um, this Mycenaean conquest did involve allies on both sides. Um, I've listed them there. A uh, fragment of Tertius, uh, well, a paraphrase by Strabo of Tertius uh, seems to suggest they were all listed there. That's maybe open to some doubt, but an actual papyrus fragment of Tertius that appears to refer to Arcadians and Argives uh, fits quite well. Um, and I would stress as well that the, the later, the, the tradition in Pausanias, which makes a great a big deal of these allies, is the one bit of Pausanias' account that can't have come from his very um, unreliable Hellenistic uh, sources, um, because it features right at the first few years of the, uh, the Mycenaean revolt, the second Mycenaean war, which is uh, the, the one bit that these uh, that Myron uh, and uh, Rianos didn't uh, cover in their account. So this comes from some kind of other source. And there are uh, alleged allies on the Spartan side as well, at least one of them mentioned by Herodotus already. So potentially here we have, you know, another glimpse of a world in which um, conquest by land uh, involving multiple allies uh, already exists at this quite um, early stage. Um, we have the tradition of um, Elis's conquest of, of Pisatis and Triphilia, these neighboring regions. Um, uh, in alliance with Sparta and Leprion, we are, we are told they occupy the, the territory, they destroy some cities, um, impose tributes on others. Um, this is presented as, um, to coin a phrase, uh, taking back uh, control uh, by Elis over these areas, which they um, allegedly always had, um, but given the location of Olympia in the region of Pisatis, it's clearly much more likely that it is, represents um, a, a conquest by Elis of this neighboring territory. Um, and um, I think I'm, I, I won't have enough time to go into detail, but there are two um, other episodes uh, involving uh, war between Elis and, and Pisa. Um, on the chronologies given by our sources, these happen 
much earlier than, than 580, um, but there is a kind of low chronology um, that would actually uh, mean that they all happen at the same time. And that in fact, and this would be my argument, um, these uh, three um, traditions are three different versions of the same set of events that um, uh, later uh, Greek ancient scholarship has turned into three separate episodes. So I would argue um, shortly after Sparta uh, conquered um, Messenia, uh, Elias did something very similar and, and conquered its neighboring regions with um, support of Sparta, uh, whereas the, uh, the victims in this case had the support of, of Argos and the famous uh, Phaidon, uh, dated according to Herodotus' scheme in about 580. Um, well, there's a tradition about uh, Argos, about uh, Phaidon of Argos, his own conquests, um, the lot of Temenos, which he supposedly reunited, um, uh, quite a large lot of territory, um, apparently. Uh, this may not be true, um, but even if it isn't, it expresses uh, an ambition of conquest, really quite substantial conquest, that Sparta must have project, uh, sorry, that Argos must have projected in order for this tradition to make any sort of sense. Uh, we know of the, um, the helot-like subject population of Argos. Um, perhaps these were acquired as part of this um, process of expansion. Uh, we know of the tradition of Pleisthenes of Sicyon, who was supposed to be very warlike. Sicyon also with helot-like subjects. Um, I've argued this elsewhere in detail, so I won't um, go um, say much more. Um, seems to me quite possible um, that uh, this all reflects uh, patterns of warfare similar to those found in, in Sparta. And even the first sacred war, uh, the other famous archaic war, uh, may, be, uh, may be seen as in this light. It could be seen as a reflection of Thessalian expansion, which uh, doesn't actually stop at, um, at Delphi, but goes uh, way into focus and even into Boeotia in the early sixth century. Um, so, so I'm sorry, I'm really just rattling through this, but just to show you that um, there is more material that one could use. Um, Land-based uh, expansion, Cyrene, about in the late 570s, this remarkable uh, oracle by Delphi, which is completely unambiguous. <laughs> you must, have, all Greeks must go to, uh, to Libya. Uh, if you come there too late when the land has been divided up, you will regret it. It's a, a massive land grab. Uh, at the expense of the native population here. Um, settlers from a lot, large parts of Greece are mentioned. Um, the result is really large-scale warfare against the Libyan Egyptian army, uh, Libyan revolt, many, uh, many dead, um, uh, allegedly. Similarly, against non-Greeks, um, Heraclea Pontica and the Mariandinians, um, circa 560. Uh, the story of Syracuse, which, according to the Cities, you know, the initial settlement expels the natives, uh, and then uh, yet by 591 we find a large subject population um, brought together from many places, according to Aristotle, which I take it to mean subsequently to the expulsion of the natives, the Syracusans have created a new subject population by at least sort of slave raiding in the Sisal hinterland. Um, um, well, this is not the full list, but you know, I, I hope this gives you uh, enough of a, uh, a range of evidence to suggest that there really is something going on in the decades either side of 600 BC, where a large number of Greek states are expanding um, uh, on a very substantial scale, uh, creating naval uh, empires and land-based empires. Um, before that, um, I think perhaps um, we, we have put quite a bit of evidence of warfare, but it's not so obviously expansionist and imperialist in the same way. So I, um, I would tend to label that maybe predatory war. Um, there's a couple of this, this, some of this has been really well discussed by uh, you know, Luragi back in uh, 2006. Uh, again, this is really just a reminder of some of the key uh, bits of evidence. Um, Assyrian um, documents from the late eighth century referring to Ionians uh, plundering and raiding, evidently on a substantial scale. In the, the first text there, they attack three cities, of which the first one, Samsi Maruna, is apparently a quite sizable uh, one. Um, a, a long history is alleged here of uh, attacking Phoenicia and Cilicia by Ionian raiders. Um, we've got the um, late 8th century Athenian um, uh, Markers, uh, grave markers from the Keramikos showing these uh, 
I take this to be a beach ship with um, Athenian soldiers marching out from it um, to uh, attack. Uh, and here, um, uh, a warrior perhaps uh, returning to his ship, having left many dead in his wake uh, on the left. Um, and here, uh, another one uh, fighting around a beached uh, ship. Um, perhaps uh, significant that the first two that I showed you are uh, as I say, grave markers, sort of glorifying uh, Athenian raiding success. And that this last one here, where the, uh, the, the, the men on the ship seem to be at bay, and that some of them have already uh, been uh, killed in the fighting, uh, is on an okuri, you know, not a formal grave marker, but uh, sort of a, a more informal uh, medium that perhaps shows the other side of raiding. Uh, and again, you could say this is not warfare, this is just raiding. Uh, but I would say that the, the prevalence of these scenes in um, uh, late geometric uh, art in, uh, in Athens uh, strongly suggests that this is a key part of, um, of uh, elite Athenian life. Um, there's also mercenary service again covered uh, well by uh, Luragi. I've got a, a long paper on the Greek mercenaries in Egypt forthcoming that uh, down dates that a bit but that doesn't change the picture uh, too fundamentally. Uh, we've got traditions um, the foundation legends of Phokia, which are rather bloodthirsty and feature the Phokians as, in effect, mercenaries. Um, uh, we've got, of course, the very extensive Greek overseas settlement from the uh, 8th century onwards, where I'm inclined to, uh, to go with Robin Osborne's uh, take on that, that this is very largely uh, private or at least independent settlement, not actual empire building uh, yet, but certainly something that also must have involved lots of military force used against locals. Um, and then the, the role of war also in the processes, the really structural progress processes of integration uh, of smaller settlements into larger political units uh, and, and the creation of settlement hierarchies in the Greek world itself, where again, one would imagine that warfare, violence at least, must have played a part from time to time. And there are some traditions, uh, literary traditions that might fit into that uh, context. Um, so, um, so that um, is the kind of early history of Greek warfare from predatory um, in the 8th century to um, expansionist and imperial even by the late 7th. Um, big objection to this, I imagine, would be to say um, uh, if Greek wars were fought by smallholder uh, hoplites, um, they couldn't possibly have waged these expansionist uh, wars because these small farmers wouldn't have the time or resources to spend fighting abroad. Their interests would, in any case, have been mainly defensive, you know, protecting their own land. Um, so this whole story uh, becomes, uh, that I've been telling, becomes what, impossible. And this is presumably one reason why people um, don't often tell it that way. Um, but my argument is, and here is where I um, uh, find myself in, in, in disagreement, unfortunately, with might, um, that early hope lights and horsemen and naval adventurers were not uh, small working farmers, but typically leisured landowners of the type found in Sparta, Crete, Thessaly, the Hippes of Eritrea, the Hippopotai of Chalcis are other well-known examples. Um, and I've got uh, an elaborate and repeated argument elsewhere about the Zugitai uh, in, in Athens being also a quite small uh, leisure class. So that these uh, are the, the hoplites, a small uh, elite group, supported quite possibly quite often by uh, further manpowers precisely from the kind of dependent laborers that don't have their own land or enough of their own land um, to live off. Um, uh, and that it's these people that are waging these expansionist uh, wars of the, uh, and predatory wars of the early period. So finally, the last two slides, you'll be happy to hear. Uh, apologies for overrunning. Um, finally, uh, what happens after 550 um, is that we then, that we do see structural changes in warfare uh, because we see structural changes in um, social uh, structure um, and economic uh, structures. Um, I argue that we see the rise of a hope like middle class then you know, in the late sixth century because um, these expansionist wars I've been talking about increase resources, give people uh, opportunities because the kind of civil conflict, uh, Salonian that might mention, but also a whole range of other civil wars are tested uh, around about 600 BC, uh, lead to uh, restraint on exploitation, um, again, giving people better opportunities. The development of trade and regional specialization, uh, making it possible for even 
uh, small, small holders to become viable uh, as market production becomes an option, uh, all of which tends to make previously dependent labor uh, independent and give rise to this new class, um, which then has implications for warfare um, because uh, uh, the the limitations normally uh, associated with hope like warfare now do come into force. Um, uh, this is the, the second point actually, uh, um, that um, th these uh, hope light armies, these land armies will be uh, more or less restricted to seasonal warfare, more defensive, they will go for the short local agonal conflict. Um, uh, but also at the same time that when you do have these larger defensive armies, this expansionist activity by small elites becomes much harder to, uh, to pursue uh, in the face of this new kind of opposition. Um, and the third point that uh, there is now a political divide between an elite and a working middle class, um, which actually uh, larger states can exploit. They can exploit this internal conflict um, and um, and expand their own power and influence by imposing regime change rather than uh, by going for outright direct um, uh, occupation of territory. Um, so um, to conclude, um, I would suggest that by about 550, the, the land-based empires that we've uh, found reach their limit of, of expansion and reach a sort of balance of power uh, amongst themselves. Um, various famous stories, the Battle of the Fattest, Battle of the Champions and so forth, Sparta policies, um, the Peloponnesian League, uh, all fit quite well in, in that type of development. Um, the goal of warfare for Sparta, certainly I think uh, becomes to really maintain control over the agricultural manpower resources that it has acquired before 550. Uh, and although we don't have the really the evidence to support that, so clearly, um, one could posit the same for Thessaly and Crete, and I think there's some evidence for similar developments in Argos and, and Elis consolidating their, um, their, their territories um, down into the early 5th century. By contrast, the naval empires actually continue, this is an element of continuity I would stress, continue to rely on elite financial resources uh, and the manpower of the landless free and slave laborers, and so are less constrained than the land uh, empires are uh, by uh, the use of hoplite forces. Um, they, um, they too can exploit regime change as a, a means of hegemonic warfare, um, and uh, this adds uh, a weapon to their, their arsenal. Um, and um, thirdly, the spread of the trireme beyond Corinth um, in the late sixth century uh, significantly changes the balance of power, creating lots of new opportunities um, for, um, for would-be uh, naval powers. And Athens uh, famously, of course, capitalizes very successfully in all three of these uh, developments. So the outcome uh, was that the sort of contrast that Thucydides saw between Athens and Sparta, uh, dynamic, aggressive naval warfare on the one hand, and conservative, de defensive, hope-like warfare on the other, um, is now in place. Um, but rather than to sit at these diagnosis, which is that this was a matter of national character, I uh, hope to have shown that this was the outcome of long-term developments that affected states um, across the Greek world in similar ways um, that had their roots um, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the archaic period and even in the 8th century, uh, and that were now still pursued, but uh, with, by different means. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Han. Uh, one base for your really interesting and stimulating, I hope, uh, for our uh, listeners' uh, paper. Now, uh, we uh, have uh, approximately 15 minutes, uh, typically speaking, for questions and the discussion. So please, I see already Costas has raised his hand. Costas? Please. Wow. I mean, <laughs> this is this is mind boggling on so many levels. You've stood the old model <laughs> upside down. Um, two things. First thing is, I think it's worth introducing Vincent Gabrielson's distinction between the oligopolistic state and the monopolistic state when it comes to violence into one to argue. So I'd like to hear what you think about that. Second thing. Um, 
and therefore, where do people like the Etolians and the Cretans fit into the model, the kind of warfare they do in particular once you move to the Hellenistic period. Second thing, um, Crete in the Hellenistic period is the limiting case because there you see uh, what you normally don't see. So large scale expansion by a few communities and uh, instead of having tens of communities, independent communities in Crete, uh, by the late Hellenistic period, uh, a few communities have expanded immensely. Uh, which is something you don't see to the same extent uh, in the classical period, although you've made a very good case to show that it does happen much more than we tend to think. Is there, uh, is, is what you see in Hellenistic Crete exceptional? Or is it just a much clearer case than what happens in most of Greek history in most places? Mm. Okay, um, so yes, the, the, um, the monopolistic versus uh, oligopolistic uh, model, um, I mean, that, that I, I do think is a, is a very useful um, set of, of, of concepts to use. Uh, I guess in, in my story here and, and, and more generally, I've tended to push for, um, well, effectively the same sort of development from, uh, from oligopolistic to monopolistic, but maybe uh, push it uh, rather earlier than, than Vincent would, would have it. And so um, uh, I've got a, rel a rather detailed argument somewhere else about the, the neutrales in, in Athens. And so, and I think they're sort of re representative of what I think is the, would be the typical situation or already around 600 BC of where the resources, in this case, for example, the warships, uh, but also, you know, the horses and so forth, um, are uh, in private, you know, elite hands, but there are already mechanisms in place um, for exploiting these uh, sort of collectively. So there is a kind of balance between um, private control of, of the means, but also um, a degree of, uh, of, of monopolistic use uh, of them for for public purposes and i would uh, just going back to uh, even to homer and uh, you know there famously there are a number of references uh, in homer where um, even the the trojan war is, is uh, presented as a as a public matter you know something demia <laughs> so um the idea of um so i think there's always a tension between um the ol uh, oligopolistic model and the monopolistic model um but by 600, I think, and by Solon in Athens, uh, we've got something quite close to a, a monopoly um, already, um, at least, and my story sort of requires that, I think. Um, so now I have to admit, so the Hellenistic, you will have noticed, I, I barely got to the classical period. So the Hellenistic period is, uh, is a big blank in my, in my story yet. Um, uh, I, 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 Crete is, is certainly a puzzle, I, I, you know, I think, um, for the for the earlier period, um, basically the sort of the limitations of the evidence uh, make it easy for me just to to posit that for in the archaic period and early classical, it fits well with my sort of expansionist model. But also the idea that um, towards the end of the sixth century, maybe um, the situation gets frozen. You know that basically the the goal of of these states becomes to preserve to hang on to what they've got. Um, the implication would, I suppose, be that by the Hellenistic period, this is this has fallen apart again, uh, in some way, and that that's why you begin to see different patterns now. But um, I honestly couldn't say more than that. I, I, um, there are many people in the uh, in the conference who uh, could comment more expertly than I can on this. Thanks, Marek. Marek Pekowski is the next one. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, for this uh, very stimulating paper. Uh, I would just like to focus on one problem I, I, I think uh, they, uh, may, they may be uh, with part of your argument. Uh, when excluding the possibility of using small landowners in such, say, overseas or at least uh, pre-imperial expeditions or warfare, I think we encounter here a much too a uh, contrasting idea between uh, the small landowners and uh, other groups of the society. I, I think we may assume the existence throughout the archaic period uh, of uh, a people, uh, say, full members of, of local communities who would not be that attached to the land 
uh, who would be less attached to the um, to the static uh, view of the society or stable picture of the society, and that would be exactly those uh, who are alluded to at some point also already in the Odyssey, as those who, as one in one of the four stories of, of Odysseus, uh, and people who could easily have time and resources, and especially uh, the ambition. Uh, to be to get involved in uh, such opportunistic enterprises. So if we do not uh, assume uh, that the entire uh, community was strongly attached to the say daily uh, their daily activities uh, kind of, um, connected with with landowners landowning, then uh, we po may posit a group of people who would be eligible for such uh, such. Uh, overseas or at least abroad enterprises. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, no. Well, um, certainly. Um, yeah. You use the word. Um, if, if we assume, uh, you know, so certainly, if we assume that these people form a large group, then um, uh, we've got a different model um, to um, to try and develop. Um, it's. Yeah. I, I, I would certainly say that you know where that farmers, um, you know, there is an agricultural uh, low season, so farmers will have a bit of time to go, maybe on short raids, um, if if let's say a local, a larger local landowner um, made a ship available, you could get, um, if there was a, a middle class, you could get some of those people on board uh, for for raiding purposes. Um, that's possible, but um, uh, that would have to be really. Um, short term, you know, short distance uh, raids and nothing but raids. And so where um, uh, I see, and I may be wrong to see that, but where I see uh, more um, uh, persistent, you know, long, long term expansions where it becomes quite hard to see uh, who is going to be involved in, in this. Now, the, the two kinds of people I can see having an interest in that are people who don't, uh, people who have plenty of land and want lots more, clearly, uh, and have the means to uh, to do so, and people who don't have any land or, or very little, not enough to survive on, who would be quite happy to follow along and start a new settlement somewhere or um, uh, engage in, 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 in raiding activity. Um, uh, so, that, but that's precisely the kind of people that I'm um, positing would be, would have to be uh, available for, for um, the kind of expansionist sort of imperial, early imperial warfare that I'm uh, envisaging for, you know, for settling Sigeon, for example. Um, the only, um, I, I, for, I didn't mention this, but I think, you know, the, the only other scenario that I can envisage where you, the, the distribution of land is significantly more equal. Um, you have lots of independent uh, working uh, farmers um, where you'd nevertheless have that kind of ex expansionist activity would be if there was, quite serious overpopulation. And, you know, this, I guess, is what people have uh, used to assume, that there is some kind of driving force that makes these uh, small farmers go out and find, you know, a, a means of, of, of livelihood. Um, but given that, I think most people no longer, you know, accept that there was, that there is much evidence for um, driving uh, overpopulation, we do have to ask, you know, what, what motivates these people to go out and raid and plunder? Um, and, and so I think that makes uh, more sense for, for my model than for um, the, uh, the, the widely established uh, middle, you know, class farming uh, model. Um, because that essentially, you know, the, the middle class farming hope likes has got to be essentially a, a defensive uh, operator, in both in how they fight and, uh, uh, you know, and what motivates them. And, and you know, but also, you know, to cut a long story short, but I think fundamentally the issue is, um, is about assumptions. Um, I, I want to make clear. I completely accept that by um, that in the in the in the fifth century and indeed by the late seventh uh, sixth century, the late sixth century, we have evidence for a substantial middle class, you know, working farmer population. The only question for me is, where did they come from? You know, when did they arise? Uh, and so um, I don't think we can just project them back um, uh, by a couple of centuries. We really need to um, to work out by what means these people emerged and why they didn't exist everywhere. You know, I keep coming back to Sparta. It's a very different model of society. Is Sparta really just a weird exception or is it, um, you know, a notable survivor of a broader model that would have, might have prevailed in the archaic period? 
Thank you. Uh, before giving uh, the word to the next speaker, namely Katerina Panagopoulou, I'd like to uh, say that uh, the attendees will have the chance to ask their questions live after the presentations. And uh, uh, I hope they forgive me that I'm giving the, uh, the word first to the panelists. So, uh, and please uh, do not make uh, a presentation when asking a question. Uh, it will save us from uh, some time. Katerina, you have the word. Hans, thank you very much for this. It was uh, a very, very nice overview of uh, what is going on in this period. Um, I would like to ask who is actually paying for these weapons that these hoplites are uh, using during these wars? Uh, so my question is, if you assume that, if one assumes that, um, you know, these hoplites bring in their weapons for the city, um, uh, that would mean that they would, they would, these weapons would cost. Um, uh, would you be inclined to consider this provision of weapons as an earliest, an early form of taxation, an indirect form of taxation in the Greek polis? And um, then a number of questions comes up, like how regularly would you uh, would these um, hoplites need to uh, bring in weapons? How many? Uh, how much would they spend in a time in a wartime period for the weapons they bring into the city? Well, okay, thank you. Um, yes. So I, I well I. I certainly think that um, they um, uh, hope lights had to provide their own um, uh, equipment um, uh, certainly in the archaic period but also in the classical period um, and so yes that does um, already mean that it's um, uh, it sort of limits the the range of people that can get involved um, I would actually just um, as a slight um, sideline point out the the, the archaic vast painting um, shows these um, sort of super hope license with extra bronze armor. So there's quite a lot of that, which suggests, you know, even, even uh, wealthier people. Um, I, do, um, I do think that um, one can infer, well, we, we certainly know it from the, um, the decree about the, um, the clerics on and Salamis around, you know, 500, that there is a, then an obligation, an obligation on them to provide their own equipment to a certain value. Um, I would argue one could uh, push that back to at least to Solon in Athens. Um, and so, as you put it, a sort of taxation, at least, you know, a civic, ob civic obligation to provide, to have that equipment and a civic obligation to uh, be available to serve in that way. Um, I would say the obligation extends to defensive uh, warfare. You know, when you're really, um, uh, when, the, when the population <coughs> is demobilized, I don't think we can necessarily infer that uh, expans expansionist co campaigns were also, you know, a, cit a civic obligation. I think that uh, is perhaps unlikely. Um, but um, but yes, I think you know. Uh, uh, again, um, I would say if if one assumes that there is a, a an independent uh, middle class of hoplites, then there uh, of, of farmers, then. Um, there will have been also a class of hoplites you know, earlier on because those would be the sort of people who could afford that kind of equipment. Um, but on my model, um, the economy, the society is much more polarized so that there is, you know, there are very few people in that, in that bracket. And either you're quite wealthy and you can afford lots of uh, expensive and fancy hoplite equipment, or you're really well below that bracket and you can't afford it at all and you would just fight as a light armed person or as perhaps you were suggesting uh, have um, your equipment provided for you by one of those elite persons mobilizing uh, uh, a band of, uh, of fighters. Okay, uh, Vincent Gabrielson is next. Thank you very much. Am I audible? Yes, uh, a bit quiet, sorry. <laughs> Hans, thank you so much for this very convincing, very well-documented uh, exposition. And uh, the focus on the early empire, something we have been needing for a long time. Uh, I, I do not have a question, straightforward question. I just have a comment or, a, you know, just a, a small addition. Um, um, I think that for this early period, at least, 
the different concepts are more, you know, more mixed than separated. What is a raid? What is an expansion? What is an empire? And I'm sorry to say, uh, I have difficulties with the term proto-empire mm. because it, it, it that assumes that we do have, you know, a main form of a main empire. You know, what, what is it? An mm, empire? Mm. Um, we don't. And um, I mean, we are using the word empire, which is a, a, a Roman coinage. Uh, we do not have really, I mean, we have the arche, but arche is arche for the fifth century. But my comment is that we should pay more attention to the Greek version of empire, at least in the early period. Some people might call it a micro empire. <coughs> and it has its own name, it is pariah. So many Greek states, especially island states with naval resources, start creating their own possessions, overseas possessions or mainland possessions. And that process has been understudied, I think. The only person I come to think of that has written on the matter of the Greek Perea is Peter Funke. Mm -hmm. But this is just an article. So, I mean, that would fit also with your own uh, scenario with your own story, at least for the nearby possessions or the uh, uh, land possessions, overseas possessions of, of an island, the, the Greek um, uh, term pariah. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we start understanding, I mean, if we increase our understanding of that process of how they have been created, then I think that the separations we may become public, be, public and private, they are going to break down somehow. Anyway, yeah. that was my comment for the moment. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vincent. Um, yes, no, absolutely. The, 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 the pariah is something I should have mentioned. I mean, clearly this is um, uh, a common phenomenon. And actually the, um, the book by um, um, Evan, um, Ellis Evans that I uh, mentioned in a couple of my slides um, uh, dis discusses the, um, the Mytilenean uh, empire, as I called it, in terms of its uh, pariah. Um, so um, uh, there I would say, um, uh, so yes, I mean, that, that is another feature of, of Greek expansionism um, that one could see, uh, I imagine, from quite an early date. I mean, I picked really uh, Mytilene and Corinth as cases where the extension of the territory that I can control goes, I didn't even mention the Mytilene, actual pariah, you know, the land that's literally opposite on the coast, uh, their, their territorial claims go very much uh, beyond beyond that. So, um, but thanks for adding that to, uh, to the picture. Um, and yes, the, the issue of, you know, where the boundaries lie between private and public, that, that remains an issue. And I, I do, um, uh, I do completely accept that this that this is actually one of the developments over time across the archaic and, and, and classical periods. That, that continues to be in a flux. Um, as I say, I, I'm tending to, um, um, to, to posit more of a, a public element earlier than, than you or perhaps many other people would. But nevertheless, there is always this issue of, of the balance between the two. Uh, and certainly the, in terms of the means, um, uh, I, I'm very much with you in, uh, in, in you know, your own argument about the, the significance of the trireme uh, in, in, in changing that balance of uh, you know, between public and private when it comes to naval warfare. Mm -hmm. But thank you. Yeah. Thank you also. Uh, Mike now has the word. Mike Goyf. Hello. Uh, well, I would like to ask two questions. Uh, and, uh, first concern is uh, the sources. Uh, well, uh, uh, you, you imagine uh, the change uh, in the early 6th century, basically. So, but early 6th century exa is exactly, or more or less exactly, uh, the period uh, to which uh, um, such a reliable, more reliable, more exact memory um, from the classical period, from the 5th century, could reach. So, uh, the 5th century authors could have such more exact understanding of the 6th century history and also the circumstances, uh, be able more exactly to describe this. Uh, while on the other hand, the earlier period, the 7th century is beyond this reach of this uh, more or less reliable oral tradition. And therefore the stories from this earlier period um, um, were necessarily more um, legend. Yeah. And as is, uh, it is uh, 
nature of for all traditions, these uh, legendary stories always focus on great individuals. So uh, is it not possible uh, that uh, part of this uh, difference uh, is caused by uh, the different, uh, different nature or character of the evidence which was available for our earliest writers, Herodotus, for example. Mm -hmm. And of course, much depends on the dating, uh, how we date Phaedon of Arbus, we can easily date it also to the late 8th century, for example, and so on. There is uh, such uh, um, questions about the uh, interpretation of the sources are, of course, very necessary. Uh, and the other question uh, is, um, uh, is it not possible that already in the 8th and 7th centuries, the ships were provided not by individual leaders, but uh, you know, on a common basis. Mm. What we know is that there were no Kraris in Athens, of course. And at least Herodotus uh, assumed that these no Kraris did exist already at the time of the uh, conspiracy of Kulan in the seventh century. Mm -hmm. So is it not possible that, that the ships which were provided in the eighth century were not necessarily <clears throat> the ships owned by the, some elite leader, <clears throat> but ships provided by the community? Mm -hmm. um, thank you, uh, Mike. Yeah, well, um, so, I mean, certainly on the first point about, about sources, um, that, that clearly is an issue and that, you know, the uh, less and less detailed as, uh, the further back we go. Um, and um, I, it's it it's I suppose the upshot of, of what you're saying on that point is that that I, I I'm dating my empires too late when it might go even even further back. Um, uh, I would say there's perhaps enough. Um, well, I mean to take that uh, I, I'm one at least one example I mentioned. Uh, you know, the, if we look at these Corinthian stories of of, of overseas settlements, so we've got the story about um, about uh, Syracuse and the story about um, uh, Corsaira. Um, these um, uh, and then we have stories, uh, actually less detailed stories about uh, settlement under Kipsilus and uh, and Periander, and it it is it seems to me striking um, that the the story of uh, of Syracuse is it's uh, you know um, uh, kind of a marginal or exiled uh, uh, aristocrat in Bacchiad uh, who goes and founds this place. Um, it's it's explicitly not the whole community uh, of Corinth, um, and there is no suggestion that Corinth in, in any way is in control of uh, Syracuse subsequently, or uh, or um, Corsaira for that matter. Uh, yet the, the stories that we then get told about uh, Kipsilus and uh, Periander um, make the point that these, these new settlements are under Corinthian control. So here we do have some evidence, and yet, you know, the, the evidence tells rather different stories. And so I would take some uh, encouragement from that and say that maybe even with the, you know, given the limitations of the evidence, we can still see some changes over time, some awareness of changes over time. Um, uh, and, and I would on that basis uh, perhaps suggest um, that much before uh, the late seventh century, uh, we do have different kinds of, uh, of warfare. I mean, on the question of public and private um, ownership of military resources, um, I guess the, um, to an extent, I'm sort of retrojecting um, some classical uh, evidence, which is that uh, we mentioned this before, um, people uh, are supposed to provide their own arms and armor. Um, Cavalry is supposed to provide their own horses. I know there's eventually a state subsidy, but the principle seems to be that you rely on privately owned resources and mobilize those for, for public uh, purposes. Um, and so that, that to me seems to make it quite likely that you would also have this, and especially maybe have this for, for ships, um, that uh, you would uh, rely on the people who own uh, ships uh, uh, to make those resources available and that that's what now Crarese are all about. But as you say, I mean, the, the suggestion that they will be, I, I completely accept actually that now Curries already exists. Uh, the time of uh, Kylon's uh, conspiracy, I have no problem with that. But um, I think that still would have been a, a system where which relies on uh, providing ships and indeed horses in the, they're also, so, uh, we're told in one source that the now Curries also are responsible for raising uh, horses, um, horsemen rather. Um, that this would still be done on, on the same sort of principles that we still find 
uh, in the classical period, and that effectively the trireme is the big exception to that norm because it's just too big and expensive. You know, there, there are not enough people who can afford to keep that privately to make it viable to continue on that basis. So um, uh, there is no clear direct evidence and one could, you know, you make a bit of use of Homer maybe, but I would say that the, the general pattern of how Greek warfare is organized uh, even in the classical period, we tend to suggest private resources publicly mobilized are the more likely scenario. Thank you. Now there are more, uh, three more questions from panelists. And uh, uh, I uh, ask from uh, Mrs. Pangali to put her question. Ms. Pangali, are you there? Γιάννη, ε, πρέπει να πατήσεις πάνω στο όνομα του ατεντή για να του δώσεις το λόγο. Ms. Mm, Pangali is not here. Okay. Then, uh, δεν ανταποκρίνεται. I see she, said she wrote the treason. Yes, but still I can't because I'm not I'm not the host. Maybe Professor Brazelis can. Ah, ne. Kire Brazeli. Te akou pas ati simveni. Eh, prepi na ina kanete me na host an ginete. Kano epitopu mia stimula na to gro. Πατάτε πάνω στο όνομά μου στη λίστα και επιλέγετε το μόρ και το ελφός. Μια στιγμή να το βρω. Πατάω το participants και δεν μου βγάζει το όνομα το δικό σου. Γιατί? Πρέπει να ανεβείτε λίγο πιο ψηλά μάλλον στη λίστα ή λίγο πιο χαμηλά. Πατάω το participants και δεν μου βγάζει καμία λίστα. Ε, μήπως να πατήσετε... Όχι, όχι, το, το panel πρέπει να πατήσετε. Στάξω, παιδί μου. Από κάτω από το participants έχει δύο λίστες, panel και attendees. Ε, στο δικό μου υπάρχει μόνο participants, δεν βλέπω panel lists εγώ. Στο δικό, στη δική μου την οθόνη υπάρχει ή το, ή το Γιάννη ή την Κατερίνα ή εμένα πρέπει κάποιον από τους τρεις μας να τον βλέπετε στη λίστα. Λοιπόν. Apologies for this, we'll sort out the technicality. <laughs> we'll... What do you expect? We are historians of ancient Greece. Άρης Κιουδάκης είναι ο host now. Ωραία. Άρη, ωραία. Κάνεμε με ένα host για να το λύσουμε. Ας το λύσει ο Κιουδονάκης αυτό. Γιατί δεν το βρίσκω εδώ για να μπορέσω. Δεν πειράζει, δεν πειράζει. Μην έτσι. Two questions still pending. Ari, eh. Ah, ore. Telia, Lipon. Pam, not those to logo still, eh, still idea. Lidia is to logo. Alla prepna nix to microphonos. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Yep. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you something that uh, is actually quite simple, uh, if I may. Um, we know from, uh, so, for, so far we have known that um, methodology has suggested that Oplites were defending the country as equals, so they claimed equal rights in the polis. But you didn't say anything like that. Actually, you said it works the other way around, you actually. It's uh, the change in social life that brings change to warfare, if I understand, cor I understand mm -hmm. correctly. And I would like to ask you if the old narrative can work today or is considered outdated? Thank you. Um, 
Right. Well, uh, the 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 whole question of um, uh, the development of the hope um, the hope lights and the, and the phalanx um, and and their, their social background is, just remains um, uh, debated. I think uh, contentious. Um, there was a, uh, a book back in um, in 2013 uh, called uh, dramatically called Men of Bronze, which uh, uh, was based on a conference that uh, was going to sort yeah, had this. Uh, sort out the discussion once and for all, but of course, uh, uh, half the participants took one view and the other half took another view. Uh, so, you know, there is just a matter of continuing matter of debate. Um, uh, my um, my own view is, uh, is exactly as you say, that I think there's the social economics change, uh, other major drivers and the military changes um, uh, reflect that. Um, which is not to say that, you know, military, um, the military roles uh, played by various uh, social uh, political groups did not also have an impact of, of, of their own. But uh, but yes, you're, you're right to infer that I um, I would emphasize the social economic developments as the, the underlying factors that really change things. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Next question. Mr. Piffer, you have the word. Hello, thank you. Uh, j just to say, I'm not a panelist. Are there any panelists before me? No, no, you have the word. Oh, lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Van Weyts, for your presentation. Um, I had uh, two, two small questions, uh, one concerning appearances and the other um, more military tactics. So empire builders of the fifth century often presented themselves as the liberators of Greece and painted the other side as the subjugators. Is there anything similar happening in the archaic age? Mm -hmm. and my second question is uh, simpler. Uh, you showed uh, a few pottery images um, a bit depicting Athenian marines sailing off their ships. I was wondering what that can tell us about combined arms tactics in the supposed golden age of the hoplite. Okay, uh, thank you, Soterios. Um, yes, the, um, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the sort of the rhetoric of um, liberation and tyranny of international relations. Um, so I would say that that is um, uh, a reflection precisely of the kind of um, exploitation of internal conflict um, that I mentioned as something that becomes possible but, you know, once the, um, the, uh, the, the working farmer becomes a politically um, independent class. So you, where you have these, um, this, this, this conflict between the elite and, uh, and maybe the middle class, um, it becomes possible for external powers, for greater powers to exploit that. And uh, exactly as you say, present themselves as um, liberators or um, uh, or opposing the, um, the, the oppressors. I, I would stress, you know, the Sparta is most associated with this rhetoric of, of liberation. Perhaps we're stressing that that means um, liberation to be, you know, to be free, to be governed by oligarchies. <laughs> we're not quite maybe what we associate uh, with that. But yeah, so I think that um, we, uh, I don't think we have explicit um, we just don't have the sources that use this terminology for the archaic period. But when uh, Herodotus talks about civil wars in the late sixth century between what he calls the Pakes, right, you know, the stout people or the fat cats and, and the demos, um, that that is effectively the kind of um, um, opposition that he has in mind. And that um, quite possibly this rhetoric of liberation could have played a part. Although, as I say, we don't really have um, explicit um, testimony to that. Um, about um, uh, the, the the raiding scenes, um, yes, I mean there. Uh, I, I don't see those so much as marines, as you, as you call them, um, but I, as the actual crews of the ship. So you know they're more like uh, Vikings in a way, in that uh, the hope lights uh, themselves mm -hmm. do the rowing and they do the fighting. As it were. So. In, I suppose in a, in a way that is combined arms as well, but um, basically I think that's um, that's one um, uh, that's one of the same group um, that does, does both of this. So in, uh, one of the things about the trireme, which is probably what you're uh, hinting at, is that that does change. You know, you, you do get separate hope like marines versus uh, a large hired group of oarsmen who I think 
almost certainly would have to have been armed in some way, but not normally as Hoplite. So there you get a, a sort of um, a, dis a separation of, of roles and, and therefore different kinds of military tactics uh, coming in, I suppose. Um, but in other ways, in terms of the personnel involved, um, I think potentially there is still a continuation of the, uh, the archaic um, expansionist model. Thank you very much. Thomas Clements has also raised his hand. Uh, hello, can I be heard? Yes. Yeah, um, thank you, it's a really interesting paper. Um, I'd like to ask a question about uh, territory uh, and use of the term territory, particularly in the context of ancient polities. Obviously, it's quite a rare classical Latin word. and doesn't really take on its sort of um, jurido political meaning until the late medieval, um, early modern period. So my question is, what exactly do we mean when we talk about territorial claims or territorial expansion um, in ancient Greece? I mean, my own work has shown that it's much more likely that um, ancient polities are going to engage in claim formation and claim making over territory. But that leaves very open the question as to how they practically control or extend their rule over it. Um, so I'd just be interested to know what your thoughts were on that issue. OK, yeah, thanks very much. Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, you know, when I say territory or territorial claims, I mean, that's uh, I'm not suggesting that the Greeks had this uh, this vocabulary in the archaic period. Um, so I, I mean, very concretely, um, uh, uh, claiming um, a right, whether a right of conquest or whatever, uh, a right to use um, the resources of a particular area, in that, including uh, sometimes the manpower or, or at other times only the land and, you know, the trees and the mines and what have you. Um, uh, but you, your question about, you know, how do you actually exercise that control? I mean, that, that clearly is quite a, a crucial one and a really difficult one to, uh, to answer. Um, uh, you know, the extreme case, of course, how did the Spartans manage to control uh, uh, the whole of, of, you know, a very large region of Messenia, basically, you know, in agricultural terms, twice as large as their own agricultural territory, um, with uh, very large numbers of, uh, of people living there. Um, that, uh, you know, that is so much of a question that people have uh, sometimes um, wanted to deny that Sparta did conquer Messenia, because, you know, how, how could they possibly have done that? Um, so there, I think, you know, the, the, there is an issue um, uh, of the practicalities, but, you know, this is not one that our evidence helps us with very much. I would um, suggest that the only way of conceiving this is that uh, a, a good deal of violence and intimidation is, is involved, um, not least because a lot, a lot of the labor force would have been uh, either slaves, um, uh, you know, chattel slaves uh, or uh, coerced labor of, of other forms. Um, uh, that, um, how that was organized, I think that that can only have been done through, um, through uh, violence um, in a way that becomes easier with kind of hegemonic warfare, uh, where I think um, uh, the influence is exercised really by propping up local uh, regimes, you know, local power holders in some way, so that you don't have to exercise direct control. Um, and in a way, this is very difficult, well, impossible maybe to demonstrate, but I think this must also have been a feature of earlier expansion, um, that where, uh, where possible, um, the um, expansionist powers would make use of existing local hierarchies, you know, whatever they were, um, and work through um, local, you know, relatively powerful local persons to uh, control in some way wider territories. You know, along the along the lines of the kind of uh, the Spanish conquest of the of the Americas, which very much went through, uh, you know, um, using local chiefs and kingdoms and uh, and even imperial structures to uh, on top of which you then built the uh, the extra layer. Um, but again, that's that's pretty much pure speculation, uh, but I think we have to assume something along those lines. Uh, I must ask the organizers if we are uh, too much out of time, since we have uh, superseded 
for almost half an hour the uh, program. Do we have more time for questions or should these be uploaded in the Padlet and uh, be asked to Professor Van Wees? Let's, let's have them try to keep the questions brief, but yes, let's them uh, allow them to, to ask the questions. Okay. So, uh, Mr. Ilakis, you may ask your question now. Please, as you heard, be brief. The microphone is closed, Michali. Επανάλαβε ποιος μιλάει, Γιάννη. Γιάκη, αν μας ακούτε το μικρόφωνο σας. Μπορείτε να ρωτήσετε. Γιάκη, μας ακούτε. Και στον κύριο Γιαμάκη το... Μέχρι να συνδεθεί ο κύριος... Ηλιάκης, ας πάει λόγω στον κύριο Γιαμάκη. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Uh, thank you for your very stimulating talk. Um, you mentioned the well-known concept of the, the rise of the middle class. Uh, my question is this. Do you think that this is an athenocentric one or is it a trend noticeable in other places as well? Uh, and what about the Greek world outside of the Polish world? For example, Macedon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, to an extent, I think it is a bit of an athenocentric uh, model in that you know really the um, this large middle class is is far better attested at Athens than um, than anywhere else. Um, but now I guess I'm um, uh, I'm positing nevertheless that this will have been a more widespread um, development uh, too. Um, I, I, just referring back very briefly to um, Mike's uh, example from or Komenos in, in Arcadia, um, the, uh, there's a, a passage in Thucydides where it is said that you know the um, the Peloponnesians are all uh, autourgoi, you know, people who work do their own work, and that that's got to be a reference, I would think, uh, mainly to, for example, these Arcadian uh, towns uh, and an implication, a suggestion there that there too you have a, sub a substantial. Uh, class of, uh, of workers. And as I say, you know, we do have these numbers. Corinth actually uh, might, might use that as well as another good example. 5,000 hoplites in 480, uh, that suggests to me, it's got to be more than a, a small elite. There are, are this goes beyond uh, a small uh, aristocratic club. And so we kind of have to, again, infer that this is a, a, a wider middle class of sorts. In Corinth, I would think, you know, of all places, quite likely to include the kind of craftsmen and, and others that uh, were referred to earlier, but surely also also farmers. So, um, Athenocentric up to a point, but not, not completely. Thank you very much. Thank you also, uh, Professor Van Wees and all of you for this uh, first part of the first day, the first panel. And uh, we shall uh, have our lunch break now until uh, quarter past four Greek time, when the second panel will uh, begin. Thank you all for this and uh, take some rest and we will be in touch in almost an hour and a half. Okay, thank you.